Oh, but that would be good. Um, but anyways, it is 204. And as chair of Albemarle County Board of Zoning Appeals, I call the meeting for August 2nd, 2002 to order. The meeting is held, this meeting is held pursuant to and in compliance with ordinance number 20-A-16, an ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. Okay, next we're gonna see if we have a quorum. Uh, the members who are electronically present at this meeting are, and let's see if I can see you all. I can see Mr. Shepard. Can you please um, indicate verbally? Hello, I'm John Shepard and glad to be here. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the next on my list is Mr. Rob. I did see you here. Can you respond? I I am, I am uh, present. All right. It's good to see you. Mr. Burkhart, I also saw you. Could you please indicate that you are here? I am here. Excellent. And you look like you're at a golf course. Um, no, it's, it's the lawn on UVA. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Mr. Carrington, could you please indicate that you are here? I'm here as well. All right, we need to get a background for you. My background <laughs> certainly not as exciting as Mr. Burkhardt. No, it's, it isn't. But anyway, um, it's good to see you all. I hope everyone has been doing well. Um, it's been a hot, wet summer, um, but that's okay. Now, we do have a quorum. The first uh, item on our list is a public hearing. And it is SP 2022-00016, Charlottesville Catholic School Electronic Message Sign. Um, do, Ms. Alley, do we know if we have the, is the applicant here? Mr. Svoboda? Uh, one moment, just a second. Yes, the applicant is here and I will move them to panelists. And that is Mr. Draper. He'll be joining shortly. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McCall, do you want to go ahead and let us know what's been going on with the electronic message sign application? Yes, let me uh, <coughs> start the presentation here. Share. <clears throat> Can you see that screen, the blue screen with the title of the application? Yes. All right. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Francis McCall, Deputy Zoning Administrator. Uh, this is public hearing for um, SP 2022-16, Charlottesville Catholic School electric message sign. So the, sorry, things are in the way here. Um, this application is for the approval of a special use permit to allow an electric message sign on the Charlottesville Catholic School property per section 4.15.7D of the Albemarle County Zoning Ordinance. Some general information about electric message signs. Um, as we know, these signs need approval from the BZA, obviously, that's why we're here. Uh, the ordinance does define what this type of sign is, uh, but does not provide some general guidance, uh, some additional guidance for these types of signs when reviewing these. So as noted in the staff report and with previous applications uh, for these signs, staff believes that the basis uh, has been uh, for this review of these special use permits and these types of signs has to do with how distracting this kind of sign may be to a person traveling on the road or adjacent residential property. Uh, to that point, um, 
I have had a conversations, have had some conversations with uh, the owners at 1191 Park Road, Penn Park Road, who have mm -hmm. raised their concerns with me, and I'll go over that in just a few moments. But first, uh, let's get to a little more of the specifics on this application. Here's a view of the site uh, with the access, travelways, and the building. Oh, can can I interrupt you just for a second, French, sure. Mr. McCall? Would you please point out um, which parcel it is that you've had a discussion with the, the residents? Sure, I was about to do that in just a moment, um, but I can, I can do that here. Let me uh, get to the laser pointer right there, 1191. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is tax map. 61 uh, parcel 29 and is located at 1205 Penn Park Road, about 900 feet off of uh, the intersection of Rio and Penn Park Road. It is zoned R4, the yellow. Uh, it is surrounded by R4 and neighborhood model district zoning, as well as Penn Park, uh, which is in the city of Charlottesville there to the east. And finally, it is in neighborhood two of the Places 29 Comprehensive Plan area. So the proposed sign will be installed at the location of the existing freestanding sign as shown here. And it is, when it is in this location, it is visible from Penn Park Road, that public road. So you can look down that straight, straight away there to see that sign. So it is about 420 feet from Penn Park Road, about 185 feet from the closest property, residential property line, and about 250 feet away from the actual dwelling on those properties. So the existing sign on the property was approved in 2006 and the proposal is to replace that sign with a new 24 square foot sign with about 13.2 square feet of that sign being the electric message sign. Here's a comparison of the existing and proposed signs. The sign changes from a manual changeable messages messages to electrical electric changeable messages, along with a change to the top portion of the sign. Here's more detail to that proposed sign. So to the conversation that I had with the owners of 1191 uh, Penn Park uh, Road, um, they've stated that they are not objecting to the application, but voice concerns with the brightness of the sign. And I noted that conditions concerning the brightness are proposed to be, re to be uh, uh, introduced. The, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. The, pr the brightness mm -hmm. are proposed mm -hmm. to be reduced in the evenings. Um, so that's what the condition would do is would one of the conditions would uh, make it that make the the uh, brightness lower in those evening hours. Again, they had no objections and understood that we are trying to mitigate that impact uh, with the uh, brightness. So to the factors that go into reviewing this that the Board of Zoning Appeals acts on and the first two uh, talking about the substantial detriment and changes uh, no, being no substantial detriment and that the character doesn't change. Uh, and, and staff believes that those two particular uh, criteria are, have been met in this particular and that is outlined in uh, <laughs> the staff report. The additional, um, uh, let's see, sorry about that. Let's get the the additional to harmony with uh, the intent of the chapter, staff also believes that is, has been met, <laughs> as well as the consistency with the comprehensive plan. Even though the comprehensive plan doesn't really speak to this, uh, to signs or anything of this nature, being that um, 
uh, I, this is in the staff report, being that we evaluated this as if it, using some criteria, design criteria from the ARB, uh, we believe that when those are usually utilized on entrance corridors, trying to get to other SP approvals, whether it's this or something else, the ARB has, has established that we utilize those design criteria, And those design criteria are reflected in the last uh, uh, few um, conditions. Uh, and I can go over those as well, but those were all listed in, in your staff report as well. So to the conditions, there's a few things I'd like to go over here, just a small uh, minor things, uh, and then uh, make some suggestions on these conditions that were part of your staff report um, that particularly address uh, conditions number five and number six. Um, the the um, first part here is really, if, if we were to go with these particular conditions, wanting to change the um, uh, five to add the illumination of the electric message sign because it, it, the condition particularly said illumination of electric message signs. So wanted to make sure that this was specific to the one that was being uh, heard, uh, heard uh, this afternoon. Uh, same thing applies to uh, number six. But then there's the uh, reference to daylight and daytime um, in the ordinance. We, we don't have much guidance there um, other than what our noise ordinance identifies. We, we do define nighttime hours and daytime hours. And uh, those are nighttime or 10 to 7, 10 p.m. to 7, and, day and daytime is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So, uh, to stay consistent with those particular ones, um, uh, the uh, the particular uh, words there, nighttime and daytimes, to stay consistent there. So, to those last two conditions, uh, before you ask um, uh, what a nit is, I'm sure some of you might have that question. Um, a nit is a unit of measurement that describes how bright things like a television, a laptop screen, or other type of display, like these electric message signs, um, is how, how bright that is. The higher the number of nits, the brighter the display. The official term actually is actually candela per square meter, but we don't need to get into that technicality here. Um, the, and this, the, these two conditions here, again, come from the recommendations from the design criteria for the a Architectural Review Board if this were on an entrance corridor. And they have that 300 nighttime, 500 daytime or daylight and specifically for their conditions um, uh, and their recommendations. So, um, <clears throat> so, Specifically, again, to these two conditions, staff is, is actually going to suggest to simplify the conditions and propose to change to coincide with the applicant's sign permit application. The, the plans that they submitted for the actual sign permit state that the sign will darken to black screen after 7 p.m. to eliminate light pollution, and the sign will illuminate after 6 a.m. each morning. So I, I formulated the next to just change that a little bit. These are suggestions for you all uh, for what uh, you would want to consider. Um, but then I actually took this one and, and, and made a suggestion as well to, to even make it even simpler, which would basically say the electric message sign must darken to black after 7 p.m. and the electric message sign may not illuminate earlier than 6 a.m. Um, and th these are my, my last minute suggestions um, that I would put into the, into the presentation here so that you all can take that under consideration. And if Mr. Herrick would like to comment on any of these or anything else uh, with relation to the, to the application, um, I can answer the questions and I do have some motions at some point as well. So that is my presentation for you this afternoon. Stop sharing. Okay. If you do need me to go back, I can go back to any of the slides. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Mr. Herrick, did you want to comment on the change in conditions at all? 
Yes, Madam Chair, Andy Herrick with the County Attorney's Office. The only suggestions that I would offer to those final two conditions is mm -hmm. specify between 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. rather than just leaving one open-ended after 7 p.m. and the other open-ended before 6 a.m. It might be clearer if both conditions were phrased between 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. I think if both conditions had the uh, uh, bookends on either end, that might make for a clear condition. Thank you. And Mr. Herrick, seeing you on the screen, I didn't indicate that we have other um, people present in this meeting, and I apologize profusely. Um, Andy Herrick is here uh, representing the legal team at Elmore County. Uh, James Bowling is here uh, representing the BZA. Um, Bart Svoboda is here in his lovely blue shirt as the zoning administrator uh, for Albemarle County and Marcia Alley, who works harder than probably all of us in between is, and uh, Marcia, I don't know what your um, title is. What is your title? I am for the zoning division. I'm a management analyst. Management analyst. Thank you, Ms. But Anthony. for today, I'm the BCA <laughs> clerk. <laughs> Thank you. And I also see that Lisa Green is here. And Lisa, I don't know what your title is now. I know you work in zoning, but I'm not sure. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm the manager of code compliance. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Is there anybody that I missed? And I, I, I truly apologize. I just got moving here too quickly, I guess. Um, okay. Now, and... Um, Mr. Draper, I am sorry, it is Mr. Draper. Um, did you want to then present any kind of information uh, on, this, on your sign application? Do you have to unmute him, Ms. Alley? Or can he unmute himself? Mr. Draper, I see your hand. It's your turn. You may speak now. You can unmute your mic. We'll, we'll give him just a second. Okay. Looks like things are changing. <laughs> Mr. Draper? You look like you're unmuted, Mr. Draper. Would you like to present any additional information or comment on what you just heard? Or both? Oh dear. I can sympathize. <laughs> Let's just pause for a second. <clears throat> Mr. Draper, I'm going to change your role to attendee and let's try to add you back into the meeting for discussion. So just um, sit tight for just a second. I believe we lost him already before I could move him. Oh dear. Hang on, let's see. While we're waiting, I'm waiting. Uh, Mr. Bowling, I know you're using your phone because you can't. Can you hear me now on your phone? Okay, so. You'll need to you'll need to speak using your mic on your screen. We're having some difficulty. I don't know what we might go be going on here. Hang on just a second. And Marcia, Francis like Murphy, I see your hand raised. If you will be patient with me just for another few minutes. And I see Brian Draper has arrived again. So 
Let's everybody just pause for a second. Let me move Mr. Draper and Francis Murphy. I will get to you in just a moment, okay? Mr. Draper should show up momentarily. And Mr. Draper, if you unmute your mic, you have the floor, I believe. Hey, can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, sorry about that. I was trying to talk on the phone and then watch it on the computer and it wasn't linking up. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the comments I was going to make is, uh, you know, it has an auto dimming light uh, function on it. So automatically you can set it on a time or, um, or you know, as the sky darkens, it'll automatically um, darken as well. You can set it to go all the way black or you can set it to go, you know, as dark as you want. Um, I noticed that on the recommendations, it uh, said that the message should only change every 15 minutes. I know that at the uh, Pantop Shopping Center, that one changes about every 30 seconds. Um, if there's multiple events uh, going on or um, information that needs to be displayed, um, you know, I feel like 30 seconds would be, um, would be a nice slow change on that. Um, it also has FEMA response built in. Uh, so there's Amber Alerts, Silver Alerts, um, you know, bad weather, tornadoes, things like that. It can be automatically displayed on the screen. Um, and, you know, I'd recommend having it dim to, you know, about 75% dark. Um, but the residents that are in the area, they can actually benefit from having those FEMA uh, response alerts for the um, housing around there, as well as the safety of the students and staff at the school. Um, but uh, in, you know, it is visible from Penn Park Road going down, um, but you know, you only get a split second to view it. Um, it's, it's hard to see as you're driving by. Uh, let's see. And, uh, and I think that's pretty much all that's gonna be there. Um, it is LED. Um, and uh, it's pretty much replacing the exact same for same, except instead of people going out there in the snow and rain, rain to change the lettering and everything on it, it's on a cloud server. And also, um, it, it, since it's on a cloud server, you could be anywhere in the world. You could be out in California or whatever, um, and they'll be able to update the, um, the message board. So if school is closed that day, they can actually you know, change it from home or wherever they're at and put, you know, school is closed today and um, not have to actually send someone in and risk them going to the school to actually, you know, put a message up or anything like that or change the um, message on the answer machine and things like that. Um, so it'll actually benefit everyone as well as, um, you know, making it safer for everyone. But but, um, but dimming the sign, um, you know, too black or just dimming it way down with a very slow change of the message is completely acceptable and completely doable. And that's about all I have. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, is there anyone else that's representing the school that wants to speak about this item? If not, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Uh, is there anyone from the neighborhood that, that has uh, logged in? Ms. Joseph, give me a moment. I wanted to get back to Francis Murphy. Um, okay. Hang on just a second, because I know that hand was raised. Okay. Francis Murphy. If you could unmute your mic, were you I, raising your hand to speak on a particular project? Yeah. No, I just, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, no, I, I'm, I'm the business manager at Charlottesville Catholic School. So and before Mr. Draper managed to show up, I was just, just in case he wasn't around, I was just about to offer the same information that he just offered you. So I really, beyond that, I don't really have anything to add uh, other than very much stress. And we would love not to have to go out there in the snow and change some letters. 
But uh, other than that, as I say, Mr. Draper very much explained what we're trying to achieve. Thank you for your consideration. Okay. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we had acknowledged your hand raised. Thank you. Um, okay, do you think there's anyone else that you see that might be interested in speaking about this? Currently, because there are no hands raised in oh. our chat area. Okay. So at this point, I don't see any anyone signed up to comment. Okay, if that is the case, we can close the public hearing and hear what the uh, members of the BZA are thinking at this point. Um, Mr. Burkhart, what are your thoughts? Not too many. I, I, I um, uh, am pleased to, uh, so look at my notes. I was actually making some notes to say, you know, we should have... Uh, blackout from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m., but the hours are perfectly uh, suitable. I was uh, pleased to see that those were uh, added uh, uh, in that slide presentation. The only question I have is under the harmony section um, of the slide that you presented where there were factors to be considered when acting. And I noticed on the packet that we received it, uh, I won't read the entire thing, it says as applicable and with the public's health, safety, and welfare but on your slide, I noticed it said general welfare and in quotes, equity. Could you explain to me what that means, please? What is see the where we're talking. The, yeah. So the, <laughs> yes, I think the, the, the particulars that I changed, it, I think I took some of the originals from an older section of, of the Harmony, that was, and that had been recently revised uh, as far as the uh, uh, public health section in general, including equity. Um, I believe that uh, th that's a, one of the particular, uh, Bart, help me out. I don't know what we call that as far as the... Um, well, it's it's Marshall Bowler, powers. presenting administrator. So, so what we're trying to do is make sure that we're aware of the community, in a sense, right? And, and where we approve things that are special, and we want to make sure that we take the time to consider what's in that area, um, as far as the types of of residents. It, it could be income. It could be types of housing. It could be those sorts of things. So we want to make sure that um, opportunities exist uh, and also that also we don't um, hamper any opportunities for the for a community by approving uh, a special exception for in this particular instance assigned. So we, we want to make sure that we're at least equivalent to um, what the regulations would call for and, and that we're taking all that into account. You know, just fair fairness, but, but equity. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burkhardt, I want to ask you, uh, one of the things that was mentioned is um, requesting, at least I think I heard this, the ability to have the, the sign change more quickly than once every 15 minutes. What are your thoughts on that? I know the sign uh, that the applicant was talking about on pan tops. Um, obviously, it's in a high high traffic area. It, it doesn't uh, it doesn't bother me. But I think the uh, uh, the fact that they can I don't know how much messaging uh, a, a school would put on there to be honest. Uh, other than you would have it go from one message to the other with a certain time time period where you know you would have the switch over. Um, I'm in favor of that. Uh, I have no objections to that. No objections to it being um, turnover quicker to the uh, to the to the request that that, that was made um, by the applicant. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to add to this conversation? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. We will move on to Mr. Rob. Mr. Rob, what are your thoughts, please? I have uh, no re no issues related to this. Uh, it seems to be perfectly sensible and well thought out. And uh, 
thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Rob. Mr. Shepard, what are your thoughts, please? Well, uh, I agree that, uh, I would agree with going with the applicant's request to have a faster turnover in the, in the change. And I also think it should be that the hours should be extended so that it's at, at least as, is visible for at least as long as the old analog sign is. It's often light after seven o'clock. Uh, and that could be a time when a game is, uh, you know, events are ending and then the sign would be off. It seems like uh, I would like to see the, the time extended in the evening. I like the idea of uh, reducing the brightness, but I think it should be legible later. I would be in favor of it being legible or readable later in the evening. Do you have a specific time in mind? No, I would, if it would, if sunset or, or, or something like that would be able, would be specific enough for a condition, I would recommend that. I mean, basically when it's, I think it's, it should go off when it gets dark, but I, those aren't, I'm not sure how to formulate that in a technical way. Okay. Um, Otherwise I'd say go to nine o'clock from seven to nine. If I had to just like for you know to start the conversation about where to extend it to, I would I would think nine o'clock, which would cover you know long days in the summer that should be able to read it now. Okay, is there is there anything else that that struck you as something you could support or not support within the conditions? No, I, I, I support the dimming of the, the dimming of the sign uh, as it becomes darker and I appreciate staff working with the adjacent neighbors and coming to a nice accommodation for that it seemed like that uh, addressed everybody's concerns and I appreciated that um, do you have any problem with um, the one condition about, displaying it for a minimum of 15 minutes. So you do you have a problem with it moving um, quicker than that? No, I, I, I would support the applicant's request. Okay, thank you. And which was 15 seconds. I think it was 30, but that's okay. We'll, we'll clarify that. But anyway. What um, Kurt said. Okay, <laughs> do you have, do you, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Carrington, what are your thoughts, please? I think a lot of them have been expressed already. Um, my general sentiment was just that this sign is is really far off of Penn Park Road. And um, I think this is a, a good setup. I think staff has done a good job um, addressing the brightness and you know how we ultimately come to a conclusion in terms of stepping it down or turning it totally black. Uh, you know, I don't really have a, a strong opinion on that, but I I actually think it's a really good suggestion to be able to turn it um, over every 30 seconds. I mean, I think that makes it a more useful sign and um, it certainly doesn't flash or scroll or anything like that, which I think is the intention, right? So um, 30 seconds definitely doesn't bother me. Uh, I would be open to considering something even shorter than that if that would suit the applicant's needs better. Okay, anything else you'd like to add? That. Okay. Um, I was looking at this and how far away it was. I think, Francis, you told us it was 410 feet from um, Penn Park Road to the sign itself. That's correct. Right? So that's, that's correct. And I looked up how big a football field is, and a football field is 360 feet. So it's, it's further away than a football field. And it um, I guess the other thing I was looking at is the height of this and the sign itself, I think, plus the base is what, maybe three feet high. So the, the aluminum, the, the sign we're talking about. So it's, it's not, it's not very high. 
And I also looked at the elevation coming from Penn Park. And those numbers were really tiny, but I came up with maybe 30 feet. Does that sound reasonable to get from? from as far Penn as Park? the elevation change? Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't look that, that specific at that, but that it's, probably it's, sounds reasonable. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. It, it, the, the road is higher and it dips down in, into the site. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that this sign is not for the general public, it's not saying, come on in, we've got a bake sale today. For most, from what I can understand, the idea is to provide information for the users of this site, whether it's the parents or the kids or whatever. Um, so I, I don't have any problem at all with, with the sign moving. Um, I think that the ARB, when they, was look, they were looking at this, they were looking at something that may be set back, what, 10 feet from the road and I don't know how tall they are, 10 feet high, whatever it is, but it's, it's, it's more of a commercial activity that the ARB may be looking at for their recommendations. So I, I think that this is very, in my opinion, it's just very different. So I also could support the, the change in letters um, much more frequently because these, these guys are going up there and they're going to drop off somebody or they're going to park and to be able to just kind of read this and not wait for 15 minutes if, if something needs to change on the sign. Um, I, I also wonder from, did you hear from the applicant whether or not um, they have any evening um, events that this, this might be helpful because that's the other thing is that shutting this off at seven o'clock, I don't know if there would be anything that goes on up there after seven. I did um, not directly, but it does look like uh, Mr. Murphy may be able to answer your question if, if, you, if you're so let him do that. Um, if I'm so inclined. Inclined. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, sure. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that question. So yeah, because I don't know. And and uh, you know, if even we're talking about, I think that they have sports fields there, and whether or not they have, I don't know if they have lighting. I have. I don't know what they do in the e evening there. Um, Mr. Murphy, would you like to answer that question? Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking the same myself. Now we have evening events on a very occasional basis, uh, ranging from graduation, obviously at the end of the year, um, to uh, to uh, you know, I would say no more than three or four, five events throughout the year where there's an evening. So if we had a restriction on it in the evening, yeah, it, it's not ideal, but it's not going to make us change our mind we still want to sign but it would be beneficial to you know use it on occasion at those evening events now those evening events would never go beyond eight or nine o'clock at night you know it just it, it's never that and to answer your other question yeah we have sports field but there is no floodlit sports field so we don't have evening sports events but we may have a mexican fiesta we may have a spaghetti night we may have you know something of that nature but again as i say no more than a few nights in the year certainly not you know regular so that answer your question yeah I, I expect you're gonna have some kind of saint patrick's day <laughs> I would love to accept. Oh no, I better not tell you the diocese don't like us without alcohol, you know. <laughs> but then again, <laughs> uh, I'm looking for St. Andrew's Day. I'm Scottish, so I prefer St. Andrew's Day myself, but that's okay. Um, okay. But no, we don't. But we, you know, I will make a recommendation if you like. <laughs> Um, um, no, 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 that, that I don't want you to think this is part of your, your sign application. But anyways, um, well, thank you. So we're looking at eight or nine o'clock then is yeah, what I hear. Yeah, at most, at most, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um, if, I think that's, does anyone else have a question for Mr. Murphy? I don't, I, I don't have a question. I just want to say that I make a point of trying to get by um, the, uh, the properties or parcels that come before the BZA so that I can visually get a sense of you know, what it is because sometimes these drawings and schematics uh, uh, seriously don't do justice. Uh, it would be helpful in the future, I think, that if we had some photos, some actual photos, which I think in this, there were, there were a couple that in there that showed the, the current and then 
you know, what the, uh, what the change would be with the sign, but uh, the drive that you take off of uh, Penn Park and you, you dip down, you've got a nice, a nice tree canopy that lines on the right hand side. And then as you come up, uh, there is a roundabout in the front of the school, which, which as you were mentioning, uh, does provide the information that, uh, that folks coming, going, dropping their kids off, uh, whatever, uh, have, have information about what's happening at the school. So I, I don't think it's, uh, uh, it obstructs anything uh, that that uh, would be you know deemed unreasonable and uh, and and for that matter you know I, I'm I'm very supportive of this applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's just one other thing that um, I think we're assuming that the existing sign is going to be removed. Should That's that correct. be a con condition? That that is correct. It's replacing it, so it will be removed. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I miss Joseph. I, I don't think that that's technically necessary because we the ordinance wouldn't permit two signs there and we in their ordinate their their application says they are replacing the, the one sign that exists. So that's how that would go through that process and, and verify that that's not happening. Okay, thank you, Francis. Francis, could you bring up the conditions of approval so we could all see them? I don't think you mean Francis. No, oh. I, <laughs> it's me. Oh, I'm sorry. There, there's two of oh, you. <laughs> Mr. McCall. Mr. McCall. Yes. Okay. So I thought I'd be able to do this. So um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Mr. Carrington has his hand up too. So I don't know if that was something else he wanted to. I can't see that now. I, I, would, I was just going to ask uh, Mr. Murphy if he had a, an opinion on how often the sign might change um, in order to maximize the use for his community. Sorry, can you repeat that question, please? Um, is there a frequency at which you would like to be able to change the signage um, in order to use the sign in the way that you want it to be used? I, I don't have a number, but what I would say to you is, is what the, uh, the applicant, Mr. Draper, suggested every number of seconds, 15, 30 seconds, whichever would be considered, sounds reasonable to me. Uh, I think, as uh, someone mentioned earlier, the way we see it working is exactly that, that the cars driving in will see it. And hopefully, you know, that it's there long enough for them to get the message. Changing that message isn't as important, but I wouldn't want to restrict it to, I think the original thing was 30 seconds. That seems long. That's all I would say to you. That does seem long. But if I'm mm -hmm. honest with you, I don't have the, I don't have, whether it's five seconds or whatever, I don't, I, Mr. Draper's got more experience on the signage aspect than I would have. Mr. Carrington, do you have any idea of what you think might be reasonable? Well, I guess I'm just trying to, you know, contemplate it as a as a consumer of whatever the sign might be trying to communicate to me. And, um, you know, in my head, five or 10 seconds seems like a, a long enough time for you to be driving down the, the road and yep. picking a child up or dropping a child off maybe and, and see the message. And then perhaps there's another thing that they would want to communicate. And yep. again, I don't think even even five seconds I don't know if that rubs anybody the wrong way, but I don't, it, it still doesn't, to me, violate the intent, which is to not have a sign that's flashing and scrolling and, yeah. and obnoxious. Absolutely. Yeah. Madam Chair, I'd like to point out that Mr. Draper has his hand raised. I'm not sure if you can visualize those indications on the screen. I, I cannot. Um, would you allow, please, Mr. Draper to speak? Certainly. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, in regards to the uh, electronic message board that is at the Pantop Shopping Center, that can be seen from, you know, 500, 1,000 feet away. Um, the display on that is at 30 seconds roughly, um, but it just scrolls the store's information um, over and over again, the same message. Um, but in this case, um, you're, you're, you know, you're going to be 20, 30 feet from it and you're pulling up to it. 
and it's before the traffic circle. So when you're driving up to the sign coming down the hill to the school, um, you know, you're going to be passing the sign rather quickly. If people stop um, and wait for the next information to be displayed, they're going to there's going to be a large backup of traffic and it's going to be a whole line coming into the school. So I think a fast enough transition being so close to it, um, I was just you know saying 30 seconds is about what the other one was. But in this case, since you're actually viewing it up close and it's information that could need to be read, um, like if you know there's an emergency weather's coming and says school is out at you know one o'clock today, um, or it's got multiple things that needs to be said because you know if you put 10 lines of information on one screen, it's going to be really tiny. It's going to be hard for people to read. And plus, when they're trying to read it, it's going to go to the next screen. Um, so having limited two or three lines um, and scrolling through multiple things, if multiple things need to be read, um, you know, it could sit on the same thing for a long time if there's no additional information that's needed. But in, in some cases, if, um, you know, 10, 15 seconds, something like that, if it needs to scroll um, multiple things that day, then I, I feel that it should be allowed. But then if it's just going to say the same thing for a long time and there's no additional information, it's all one screen, then perhaps, you know, it sits on that screen for a long extended period of time. I think it's just depending on the day and the events and, you know, what it's being used for. OK, so what I heard from you is 10 to 15 seconds. Would, would be good, yeah. And then that way you have plenty of time to read the sign and not holding up traffic and waiting a long time for the next message. Because, you know, if the message cuts off and then the next screen has the rest of the message, because, you know, you look at VDOT and it'll say like road work ahead, but then the additional information from such and such time, you have to wait for that scroll change to see, you know, where it's going to be that information um, and you're not going to sit there on 64 waiting for it to change. So I think it's depending on how many slides go with that particular, um, you know, information that's on the screen. But I think 10 to 15 seconds for multiple screens. Okay. But then if it's one screen, then, you know, it could sit on that screen for, you know, an extended period of time. OK, OK. I don't know if you can see the, the conditions, but it changed from 15 minutes to 15 seconds. OK. Yeah. And I think that's perfect. OK. It gives you time coming down okay. the hill and getting to the sign. So I, I think that's good. OK. And, uh, Madam Chair, um, I, I, I did not have conversations with them about this specifically. So I, I, I might have been able to avoid this a little bit, but um, I, I would I. I have no problem with 15 seconds, but I, anything less than that, I would think starts getting to look like it might be flashing. So I would want to potentially avoid that. That's what I would suggest. I mean, that's. No, that, that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCall for, for offering that. Um, okay. Then do we have any other comments from any of the other BCA members about this change on, on um, condition two? Okay, now content may not black uh, scroll vertically or horizontally. Okay, any, any comments on condition three? Okay, um, how about four? Okay. Um, five, I think we heard that um, they really don't have anything going on at the school after eight o'clock. Would anyone have any objection to changing the blacks? Well, actually, didn't Ms. Mr. Herrick talk about maybe changing some the, the time frame here? Um, is that something that you can show us, uh, Mr. McCall? Mr. Herrick, did you want to comment on this, please? I, I just wanted to clarify. I wasn't so much suggesting a change of the time, but that whatever time is chosen, that we frame it as between whenever the cutoff is 
and 6 a.m. on both conditions five and six. So the electric message must sign, sign must darken the black screen between and then the closing time and 6 a.m. and then likewise between the closing time and 6 a.m. on condition six. That was my suggestion uh, for wording. Okay. So it would be between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. And then number six would be, um, it would, would not illuminate earlier than six. It would be, it would be illuminated um, between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. If I might, if I might suggest, it would be the same as condition five. It may not illuminate between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. It would be this, the closing to each would be the same. Okay, Mr. Herrick, would you take a look at electronic message sign must? Should they both say may? We've got must and may there. Does, does it matter? I, I think that works as long as we complete the thought between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. for both. Okay. So it's 8 p.m. and 6 p.m. for both? Yeah. Well, it would be the message sign. It, 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 it may be illuminated between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. So not, that's the way number six should probably read. Uh, Madam Chair, I would, I would suggest for number six, the electric message sign may not be illuminated between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. with the same ending as condition number five. I think that works. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, okay. Mr. Bowling, you wanna comment on this at all? Um, my only point is that, can you, is that, can everybody hear me okay? You're echoing. Yeah, I know it's unavoidable because I have using my uh, cell, cell phone speaker to, um, hear you. Maybe that'll help. Did that help? No, but we can, we can hear you. Yeah, just keep right, talking. Well then, the, the, what my point is that if you're going to, Andy, if you're going to use a word, use must instead of may. Okay. So I number six. The point was well taken. So number six should read um, electric message sign must Okay. Do we have any more discussion on these conditions? Does anyone have any thoughts? Okay, Mr. We, Shepard, what's, what are you thinking? Uh, I think we got to the eight o'clock without really discussing it. I would, if events last until eight, I think it would be reasonable to allow the sign to be in operation a bit after that. Uh, you know, as everyone, you know, if you actually had an event that ended at eight, I'd like the people leaving to see the to see the sign before you know still in operation. I would I would suggest pushing it back to eight thirty or nine, which I don't see the harm in that, and it could possibly be uh, you know serve them better. Uh, it would, it would still be useful at that hour in the in the rare times when there are evening events. I don't I don't want to hem them in that limit them in that way. Okay. Um, any other board members have any thoughts on on changing it to maybe nine pm? Mr. Burkhart, what are you thinking? I'm thinking the same thing that was just mentioned that if you've got pickup, you've got activities, um, uh, why not nine o'clock? I mean, that, that, that seems quite reasonable. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Rob, Mr. Carrington, any thoughts? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mr. McCall, could you please change that to nine?
Okay. I, I don't. I don't think we have five and six right yet. Okay. They're, they're redundant, right? So both of them are talking about it being dark at night, and maybe we can just just pick number six. Um, but I also just wanted to point out to the rest of the board that we haven't uh, addressed maximum illumination. I don't know if we want to, but that's something that has been changed from the original staff proposal. Yeah. We have 5,300 nits. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Carrington. Um, what if we just, you know, just to, to make some progress on it, just include the 5,000 nits during 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. as number five? must not exceed 5,000 nits. The host would like you to unmute your microphone. You can press star six to unmute. Andy. Madam Chair, if, if I might interject, I thought that sure. Mr. Uh, McCall's alternate language would take care of specifying the NITs. I thought the purpose of, of Mr. McCall's suggestion was to eliminate the, the technical specification of NITs and replace it with more generally understood language. And so I thought that the, the, the need for NIT specifications was no longer needed with Mr. McCall's alternate language. I, I think I was just pointing out to the board that during the daytime we haven't put a maximum illumination on it right and right. that may be a good thing to do i i presume we all wouldn't want it to be you know too bright and i don't know what how bright it could get but i think it's reasonable to put some sort of max on there so it's again not um obnoxious to the neighborhood during because again, again, none of us are experts on this, but 5,000 nits presumably is visible during daylight hours, if, if it's included elsewhere in the code. And Mr. Herring, Mr. Herring, could you please explain why you think it's not necessary? Well, I think Mr. Carrington raises a good point that there doesn't seem to be any sort of um, limitation on the daytime illumination. I was just suggesting that I thought that um, Mr. McCall's alternate um, language took care of nighttime illumination, but Mr. Carrington's point is well taken that there's nothing currently in there about daytime illumination, and so maybe that should be a carryover from the original conditions. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think Mr. Carrington is is correct, it needs to be in there. It's just a matter of how, how do we um, make sure that it's understood by the person designing this, that that's what needs to happen or the person programming this is, is that's the way it needs to happen. Do you have any suggestions, Mr. Mr. Bowling, you have some suggestions for language? Um, um, can you hear can me? You hear me? Yep, there, we seems, can hear there, seems, there seems to be no echo. No Wait a minute, there it is. Am, am I getting an echo? You ended the echo, Hello? I think. All right, good, good. I'm successful. Marsh is successful, rather. Um, we've been confirmed. No, I, I think that uh, it's, it's good to leave the staff's 5,000 nits in there. There's a technical reason for doing that. And I, I hadn't, I'm not smart enough technologically wise to figure out whether. Um, Andy's right or not, uh, he probably is about uh, no need for it anymore. Well, go ahead. Madam Chair, perhaps the way to fix this would be just to copy number six and make number six a current condition specifying at the end between uh, 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. And, and use that as a substitute for the current, um, current condition six. Okay. That looks fine with to me. Okay. Okay, we we. So I I do. Uh, have, can no, I number comment? six. Number six needs to be switched around till six a.m. to nine p.m. during the day. Okay. 
Now we're there. And what about the evening? Because we're, we're allowing um, this sign to be illuminated in, in dark hours. It's going to start getting dark at 4 o'clock in December. Um, and then my suggestion for that would be just to use the, the language that we, that we had previously for number 5. There we go. Use that number 5 and combine it with the number 6 that we were just working on. I just yeah. don't want. I just don't want uh, to it to be unclear that I can right. put up four thousand nits at between six a.m. and eight p.m. It was supposed to be either low to the three hundred between that time or totally off, is what they were suggesting as far as turning it off at at seven. It would darken at seven, and then, or and if we want, if you all wanted to change it to nine, we change change that to nine. So it darkens at nine, goes entirely off at, from 9 to 6 a.m. And then by 6 a.m. you can turn it back on to however many nits, 5,000, if, if that's what that last one needs to say, that that in, it would be 5,000 nits, no more than five, or however that uh, uh, may not exceed a luminance, if that's how that, oops. I, I I'm I'm sorry I'm I'm not I need more direction on exactly what what you all want to say here. Well, it sounds like what we're saying is from six a.m. to seven p.m. It cannot exceed five thousand nits. From seven p.m. to nine p.m. cannot exceed three hundred nits, and from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., it has to be dark. Is that right? Three different times, three different levels are permitted. I guess in my opinion, it's just about how blunt of an instrument we want to use. I think you could just change the 8 p.m. in number six to, to 9 p.m and we'd have a functioning setup. It can be up to 5,000 nits in the day and it can be off at night. <clears throat> if we wanna try and specify another period in the evening where it's capped at a low nit number, then I'm fine with that too. I was sick, uh, I agree with that except um... I'm taking into consideration uh, conversations that Mr. McCall had with the neighbor. Yes, Mr. McCall's original conditions were clear as to what was happening in daylight and nighttime. And that allowed because, as I said before, nighttime comes very early come December. So if you've got those nits out there floating around at five o'clock and it's very dark out, um, it's going to make a, a difference. I guess that's what, what I'm, I'm thinking. So Mr. Carrington, I'm, I'm glad you really brought this up. It's just how do we define that? Because we've been very rigid in defining hours of operation, but not really taking a look at what happens seasonally. So that's all I'm, I'm concerned about. And, and John, it's directly related to what the neighbors have expressed a concern. Um, so I don't know. Francis, do you have any thoughts on this, Mr. McCall? Um, I think that uh, there have been some special use permits as far as uses to go that we reference uh, uh, sundown and, and sunrise. 
So that might take, you know, as far as, and, and that changes, like, obviously, as you know, but it's, it's how they then can program their, 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 the, the machine to, to actually do that. It sounds like they possibly could, and it can be done at, at that particular case, and they may, may want them to confirm that. Um, and if, if that were to, uh, to, to go with, with that particular aspect where it's the must darken by sunset, and then, um, or two hours past sunset. I don't know if if by the if it's like, I, I don't know. I mean, that's your seasonal. That's your seasonal aspect of that. Um, so that that's that's the hard part of enforcement and and trying to come up with these. But these hard numbers like this, six a.m. to we know that there that's the case, and then we would have to to um, to move forward with any complaints that we get if if. We know that they that they're after that time. We'd have to see that, and it's it is difficult to see that at, at in the evening for us. It's not always the case. We can make those kinds of uh, kinds okay. of accommodations, but I know uh, Lisa, uh, manager of Code Enforcement, she's got her hand up if she if you'd like to hear her about a little more about enforcement of of these kinds of conditions. Sure, Ms. Ms. Green, what what do you have to add to this conversation? Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for interrupting, but if we, we do, I am the manager of co-compliance, so we will be looking at these conditions in case we get a complaint for enforcement. Uh, one of the things, uh, you are right, seasonally that would change, and so you would see something different until 9 p.m. at night. However, uh, the time change is also when you have most of your events at the school, so uh, as you're thinking about that, uh, it's always best to be as clear as possible um, and not have any ambiguity as we go out to enforce these, these specific conditions. And so what I would say is, <clears throat> you know, we have a time change at, at, in, in November. Um, and so if you wanted to go with a level of darkness, if, if that's the case, you could say a half an hour after sunset, a half an hour before, and some of that would help. Um, you know, we could use the the time in the in the calendar to to look at that uh, at whatever time of year that might be. I'm not sure if that helps, uh, but any anything we can nail down to give us something to go off for enforcement is helpful. May Thank I, you. May I add something? <clears throat> You know, we're going to hear Travis on the weather pretty soon talking about how the daylight is starting to change. And uh, I think this could be quite cumbersome on the applicant to uh, be programming this almost on a daily basis or weekly basis. Um, what was just mentioned before, um, you know, let's, uh, let, let's possibly consider, and I know that there's variances with these seasons, but, uh, you know, we, we know when daylight savings time starts and when it ends. I don't know if that's a good uh, benchmark to use. Uh, but I think as we start getting into 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after sunset, uh, they could literally be programming this thing weekly. And, and, and uh, is that really the intent? I don't know. No, honestly, uh, what I have in my brain is trying to make sure that this 5,000 nits isn't going on when it's dark out. That's all. And I, I'm not sure how to do that so that's that's kind of what I'm I want I want this sign visible I want people to be able to use it I don't it, it's not going to have that in my opinion it's not going to have that much impact on the surrounding properties but I also want to be respectful for the people who live there so that's what I'm trying to figure out and I, get, I think that's what we're all trying to figure out is not make it cumbersome for the school to keep changing it as you say um, to keep reprogramming and, and also make it so that the neighbors are comfortable. Hi. So um, I've tried this is between... about if I can if I can jump in for a minute. So we can use sunrise and sunset tables. They do it for hunting. They do it for other things all the time. Um, 
what we can refer to, I believe I heard Mr. Dripper say that this actually does have kind of a dust to dawn mm -hmm. setting and he be able to verify that. So, so we would be able to make an interpretation as to what uh, dusk to dawn means or, or sunrise to sunset. So there's some charts that we have through other agencies, whether it's the National Weather Service, whether it's game and inland fisheries, I think it's called wildlife resources now that we would use those tables as a function or measurement to determine what that, that dusk to dawn means. So. Mr. Draper has his hand up. So if that is a setting on the sign, that may be something to consider just so we can move through this uh, as far as, you know, during dusk to dawn, it's got to be these. And during daylight hours, it's the 5,000. That would be my suggestion. Is that Mr. Draper? Yes. Hey, can you hear me? We can. Okay. So uh, dust to dawn is the same thing as a photo cell. And what that is, is it's a little photo eye that uh, when it becomes dark, it opens the circuit to the electrical. So when it's nighttime, you'll see that, you know, signs and gas station lightings and things like that will automatically come on when it gets dark. Um, so that's an on and off feature. It just opens and closes a circuit to the sign. Um, what this has, it's an automatic light dimmer. And so you can set it so that as the light darkens outside, you can actually set it to lower the nits uh, or illuminations of the sign. Um, so if it was set to four or 5,000 nits in the daytime and say that it it's at 50% darkness, it can lower itself, say, you know, half the brightness and things like that. So it's all built in um, in the software um, and with the module that's on the side of the cabinet. So this way that um, it won't stay the same brightness, you know, whether it's daytime or nighttime. And also you don't have to program it. You just initially set it up to, um, you know, if you want to be at, if it's at 25% dark, meaning like the sun just starting to go down, you know, it can start lowering itself then. Um, so this way you don't have to worry about it being, you know, eight o'clock at night and displaying 5,000 nits. You can set it to say, you know, you want it down to like 2,000. Um, the other thing is you have to play with it a little bit because if it's nighttime and it's dark out and you have it set too low, the message on it's going to be completely unreadable. Um, people are going to have to squint their eyes. It's going to be harder to display the information. Um, but again, it doesn't have to be super bright either. Um, but that's what the auto dimming is. Uh, it just automatically dims and brightens. So that way in the morning when it comes on, as the sun comes out and shines, it'll increase the um, illum illumination of it. Because if it didn't, then the sun shining on it would completely block it out. You wouldn't be able to read it at all. So it has to illuminate brighter to um, counteract the, uh, the brightness of the sun. So it actually can display. Um, that's why it needs to be set higher in the daytime. But, you know, it, it can auto dim down at nighttime. So what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that it isn't anything that you'll manually have to do. You just have to figure out initially um, by going and taking a look at it, whether this dusk to dawn is working so that the sign is reasonable, readable. So you're, you, you would have to go and um, fiddle around with it, but I expect you're going to have to fiddle around with it anyways. And at some point to figure out whether these 300 and these 5,000, so it isn't necessarily always going to be 300 for every single site or 5,000 for every single site in the daytime. So what I'm trying to do is not make a lot of work for you and the school so that this thing can work and it works so that the sign is reasonable and, and the neighbor is protected. So um, Bart, do you have any language that you would suggest or Mr. McCall, do you have any language that you would suggest that would allow this to happen? If I may ask Mr. Draper a question. 
Of course. Uh, Mr. Draper, do the limits we have shown and the time moves we have specified kind of to the best of your knowledge and abilities, <laughs> would those fall between those ratings that we were just discussing? Yes. Okay, so with that being the answer, then it sounds like the conditions as, as written would, would meet the objective that the BZA is trying to. Yes, I would agree. And we can use this as a basis on this sign to go off of to write a criteria for other ones in the future. Um, and when you have like a parking light shining down over the sign or shining at the sign, you know, that's going to throw off the auto dimmer too. Luckily, this one's not near any parking light, so that's not going to affect this one at all. But, you know, in the future, you know, it is going to be tough on a case by case basis. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think the 300 nits and either uh, Mr. McCall or Mr. Draper can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's like the brightness of a TV. Just correct. to put things into perspective at, at the closeness to the closest house to this, to this particular sign. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have any other comments from BZA members? Concerning these conditions? Madam Chair, if I could offer a suggestion. Sure. Um, that condition five be effective between sunset and 9 p.m. And that condition six be effective between 6 a.m. and sunset. And that there be an additional condition specifying that it's dark between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. So you want a condition seven that it's dark? That was between... my understanding consensus of the BZA, the condition five be between sunset and 9 p.m., that condition six between, be between 6 a.m. and sunset, and that would be the condition of it being dark between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. Again, I think that's what the consensus of the BZA seems to be. Okay. Mr. Carrington, what are your comments on, on that? Um, yeah, I, I don't have a, a problem with that. Again, I think it's um, about how blunt of an instrument we want to use. And it's, if it's just adding another bullet point that, you know, creates a, a third tier, a third um, area, I think that's fine. Okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McCall, we have one more condition about the Please dark. Let me hear that one more time. If that's what, yeah. Mr. I it was the I believe it was the condition that we already had worked on on the other slide. Yeah. Now, this is what I've, I've updated so far. Oh, okay. Not so to exceed maximum luminance of 300 nits between sunset and nine, and not to exceed the maximum luminance of level of 5,000 between 6 a.m. and sunset. So it sounds like the uh, condition that you had worked on in the original slide has gone away, but there was a condition on the original slide that's, that indicated that it would be dark between certain hours, and, and we just need to replicate that condition, that the electric message sign must uh, be darkened okay. between I, 9 p.m. I, I think I know what you're, I think you're talking, uh, this one, I oh, know, the daytime hours, nighttime hours? The original that it's dark. That it's dark. Right. Original somebody, if somebody could could just state it, if that's if if the uh, uh, so that or have Miss okay. Joseph state it. How I, I I just need some help here. That's all. Hey, how, how about Andy? If if you would go ahead and state that. So the electric message sign must be dark. Between, I'll change it to the to the okay. right. Yeah. Must Between be dark. Between nine between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. Okay, now. Uh, Madam Chair, I have, I have one more thing. Um, in number two, I'm sorry. I know this is a little unorthodox, 
Um, it says the sign message must not change more than four times per hour. If we can just strike that. Yep. So that it just reads each message must display for a minimum of 15 seconds. All right. Is there anything Ms. else? Green actually caught that. Okay. A anything else on there that anyone sees that um, it's going to make it difficult for Ms. Green to do her job? Okay. Um, any other comments from the Board of Zoning Appeal members? Okay, shall we take action on this? Could you please put those back up again? Yep, sorry. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> scrolling pretty quickly there. So it would be this one. What? Uh, okay. Okay. Um, does, would anyone like to address this to make a motion to approve these since we've spent a lot of time on them? Um, anybody? I'll make a motion. Um, I move to approve SP 2022-16 subject to the conditions as amended in the presentation. Do we have a second? A second that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shepard. Mr. Carrington moves, Mr. Shepard seconds. Is there any further discussion on this? Okay, Ms. Alley, could you please call the roll? Mr. Rob. Aye. Mr. Burkhart? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Aye. Mr. Carrington? Aye. Ms. Joseph? Aye. Thank you. Thank you all for really doing a thorough job in, in really thinking about this and thinking about the applicant and, and the adjacent owners. And Ms. Green, thank you. Um, Okay, on to the next one. Yes? Do we need a break or are we rearing to go here? Everybody got their coffee? Okay. I'd like a one minute break. A one minute break? Is that, is that all right? Just a really quick break? Yes, you may have a one minute break. <laughs> Let's back. Back. Okay. I want to set the air conditioning. It's getting hot. Okay. We lost anybody? I don't think so. Um there we go. All righty. Let's uh, go on to the next item, which is another public hearing. And it is AP 2022-00002. It's 801 Franklin Street Appeal of a Zoning Determination. 
And Mr. Svoboda and Ms. Green um, are the staff members presenting this item. Yes, um, I believe I shared my screen. Let me know if that's working out. It's working. Okay. As you stated, this is appeal 2022-02 for 801 Franklin Street. Uh, myself, Bart Svoboda, Lisa Green, and also Andy Herrick will be the staff members that will be commenting on this particular application. So the applicant's request, again, is an appeal from a determination dated May 5th, 2022 that the storage of portable toilets within the flood hazard overlay district is not a permitted use. So that was the determination by the zoning administrator. The applicant is appealing that decision. The property entrance is located at 801 Franklin Street, about 200 feet north of the intersection with Nassau Street. So this is the aerial photograph, you can see uh, Nassau Street here, it actually comes down and there's our, there's our site. Uh, this is the Morse Creek treatment plant, just so everybody gets their bearings. When we talk about appeals, I know we go through this uh, occasionally and it's been a while since we've had one, but the BZA's decision on appeal is limited to determining whether or not the zoning administrator was correct and whether or not the ordinance was applied correctly. This appeal does not consider whether or not the proposed use is appropriate, whether or not it's in the public interest, whether or not the zoning regulation is invalid or needs to be amended. For the purpose of this hearing, this is only determined if the ordinance was applied correctly. There's a series of photographs that I'll show you next that are contained within the packet. So these are just duplicates of that information that was in the packet. This is March, uh, December 15th through March 16th. And these are, are the aerial photographs that we use in our computer systems here. Uh, this is February 28th through April 20th. You can see the property is vacant uh, in, in both photographs. This is February 2022 and March 22. You can actually see the Porta Johns now present on this particular parcel. These two photographs were not included in your packet, but these represent the site from uh, March 25th of this year and also May 2nd of this year. Just to give you the ground view of what this aerial photograph represents. The appellant, and it's included in your packet, has a justification statement. There were um, two items within that statement that talked about a lawfully existing use prior to April 2nd, 2014. Um, we are in, we're using that date as opposed to our, what we would maybe call a regular non-conforming date, because this has to do with the floodplain regulations, which was also included in your packet. So this is the date that's specific for decisions within the floodplain. There's a determination from 2014 that was also included in your packet where the same property owner was uh, cited and within that determination, there contains language that talks about there are no non-conforming uses on that property. So that had been determined on October 28th, 2014. That determination was never appealed. And therefore there no lawfully non-conforming use exists. So the other statement within the appellant's justification is that recreational uses, which there's no argument there that you see Porta Johns at recreational uses within the floodplain. Those particular uses are allowed by right because I provide a service to a use allowed by right doesn't make me make that particular business 
a permitted use. So a contractor that say provides a, a food service uh, at the park doesn't make it a park use that caters an event or that, that rents a piece of equipment. The use still at the park is the park. It's not, uh, it's not a equipment rental place. It's not a restaurant. So just because I'm renting or storing things that would be used at a use permitted in a floodplain doesn't make me a use permitted. Also, you should have received, and if you didn't, let me know. So I'll pause for a moment, uh, supplemental information that came in that we distributed yesterday. I'm hoping everybody got that. I'll take that as a yes. Uh, the equipment storage agreement with Boxley Aggregate, also the lease agreement with Tapscott Brothers. There were three attachments to that email that went out. And there are check stubs for rent from Summit Contracting Group reflecting rent paid through September 15th. So the, this was supplemental information that the applicant provided um, to indicate that there was a permitted use on the property. What we did with that information is try and verify that a zoning clearance was issued and that a use had actually begun. And we have been um, unable to come up with those records. So the zone, our zoning records indicate that no business uses listed above received a zoning clearance. Section 31.5 of the zoning ordinance says that any new use, change of use, intensification of use, or change of, of occupant, a zoning clearance is required to establish that as a legal use. So none of those things took place. If, in other words, if I rent my property to someone and I don't follow the correct steps to legitimize that, that use or the appropriate regulation, doesn't make that a legal non-conforming use. It might be considered a use, but not a legal, not a legal one. Non-conforming uses have to be legal, not illegal, or permitted. In summary, on May 5th, 2022, the official determination of ZVIO 2022-76, and it's in your packet attachment B was issued. It was a determination that the storage of multiple portable toilets, a contractor storage yard in the floodplain is not a permitted use based on the parcel history and the October 2814 determination, which you also have, uh, a lawfully non-conforming use did not exist on this parcel and a contractor storage yard is not a use that's permitted by right within the floodplain. Because the zoning administrator's determination was and is correct, Board of Zoning Appeals should affirm this determination. So that concludes staff's report. I can land on any of the photos if you wish. I know the uh, appellant is here. And if you would like, I can take the presentation down. So what's your pleasure, Madam Chair? Does anyone want to see anything um, that was placed on the screen before uh, Bart takes it down, Mr. Svoboda takes it down? Okay. We can refer back to it. Okay. Also, um, Mr. Herrick may have um, some comments to add. Mr. Mr. Herrick? Madam, Madam Chair, I can do that now if, uh, if you have no questions of Mr. Svoboda. Um, I, I really don't have much to add to what he said. Again, I'm Andy Herrick, Deputy County Attorney. Um, basically, I think this is a pretty straightforward case. Uh, a storage yard is a, is a permitted use by right in the light industrial district, but it's not permitted um, in the um, flood hazard overlay district, which this is. Uh, in order to be a permitted use, it would have to be, uh, if at all, legal non-conforming, which is to say, that it would have had to have been established as a use prior to April of 2014, and then continued without being discontinued um, since that time. I think the aerial photos that Mr. Svoboda showed in his presentation showed that the property, in fact, 
uh, was discontinued, that there wasn't a continuous use of this property as a storage yard. And even if there had been, I think Mr. Svoboda's final point was that it hadn't been established as a legal use. In other words, that the applicant had to come in to get zoning clearances, which would have been required to continue it as a legal use uh, after 2014. Um, so I agree with Mr. Svoboda's presentation that because it was not a permitted use in the flood hazard overlay district, it wasn't established as a legal non-conforming use, and that it was discontinued uh, subsequent to 2014. I agree that Mr. Svoboda's determination is correct and should be upheld. And I'm, again, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have as well. Does anyone have any questions, need a little bit more clarification um, on this issue? I just have a, a, I, I have, I have a couple. So a, a complaint was received um, on, I believe, March 20th of 2022, and I, I didn't see a copy of the complaint in the packet. Can you uh, share with us, uh, you know, who the complainant was and what uh, apparently precipitated this, uh, this action? Yes, um, I can elaborate, or, or Ms. Green here also can. So we take our complaints now either by phone or online. And so we don't have what, what used to be our old style complaint form um, where we get one in, where you fill out a form and it's in writing. So that gets logged into the computer. It gets assigned to a, a CCO, a code compliance officer uh, or Miss Green and it gets investigated. Mm -hmm. And the result of that investigation um, we contact the property owner and proceed through our normal procedures to try and get things into compliance. Uh, Ms. Green, do you have anything to add? No, I think that covers it. The second, uh, the second question I had, um, uh, has there been or is there, you know, a regular annual inspections of the uh, county's flood um, hazardous overlay district? Uh, if so, wouldn't this uh, activity have been um, identified and uh, uh, noted prior? I'm just, just kind of curious whether or not the code allows for uh, routine and regular inspections to make sure that those in the floodplain are in compliance with county code. So we do not have a program where we monitor or that where we're proactive in zoning violations whether they're in the floodplain or not. So we operate essentially on a complaint basis. And when we receive a call, um, that's when we go and investigate. So we currently have four positions that cover seven, the 744 square miles of the county. Thank you. Mr. Shepard, did you have a question? Not really a qu I wanna just uh, ask for a couple of repetitions just to make sure that we all understand a couple of points, one. Is this entire parcel in the floodplain? Floodplain fringe, floodplain, floodway. Just what is, could you clarify that for me? I believe that the answer to that is yes. And the uh, appellant may be able to speak to that a little more, but I believe it's all within the 100 year floodplain. In this particular case, the 100 foot stream buffer is actually. It's, it's on the property, but it, it actually is shorter than the 100-year floodplain. But the floodplain goes all the way to the road? Yes. Okay. It may actually go past the road. That I do not know because jurisdictionally, our, the map that I look at does not uh, indicate whether or not it actually crosses Franklin Street. Okay. I just want to, just as we go forward with this, I just want to agree <laughs> on that. Another thing I want to understand is, the, the, this is use is determined to be a contractor storage yard, which is by right in the LI zoning district, uh, provided it meets all all the requirements, including a clearance and all that. But this is a by right use. If it wasn't for the floodplain, uh, Mr. Shepard, a uh, storage yard is uh, by special use permit in the light industrial district. But because, as you indicated, because this is the flood hazard overlay district, that supersedes and it's not a permitted use either by right or by special use permit in the flood hazard overlay district unless the applicant can establish a legal non-conforming use. I understand. So this, so this, if it wasn't a floodplain, it would have required a special use permit. 
Correct. Okay, good, thanks. Anything else, Mr. Shepard? Nope. Mr. Carrington, do you have uh, some Mr. questions? I do. Mr. Herrick, you used um, the term continued without being discontinued, and I'm interested in uh, understanding that and in what the time frames that you might apply there. Right. Maybe. So so a legal non-conforming use cannot be discontinued for a period of more than two years. That's the, the standard under both state law and the Albemarle County Code is that it is not allowed to be discontinued for more than two years. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. You have any other questions, Mr. Carrington, at this point? No? Okay. All right. Mr. Rob, you didn't have your hand up, but I want to ask you, do you have any questions? Uh, very briefly, and maybe it's the answer has already been uh, presented in the material that I didn't uh, see. When was this floodplain, what date was this floodplain identified and by what what uh, authority was this identified? So the, the overlay district, it was April 2nd, 2014, when the latest update was done. The authority comes through the zone, the, the enabling legislation through the zoning ordinance out of the state code. From what I understand in past experience, there's been some uh, question as to the the, the identification of their floodplains, they, they have changed. And, uh, and by the federal government, I think, and, this, and the state uh, jurisdictions, there's been some di discussion, at least, uh, and I'm not sure that's ever been, maybe uh, Mr. Bowling could help me on that. Uh, was, it, was the floodplain established in, in 2014 and by whom? Is that for Mr. Bowling? It's for anybody that can answer it. I think it's well, FEMA. Uh, the is a, is a creature of FEMA, I believe. And yeah. staff, you correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, I don't know precisely at what point it started to be recognized by the Albemarle County Zoning Ordinance. I do know it was in effect in 2014. Well, well, I've had, you know, I've had experience with this, frankly, on, on some a personal issue, that there was some question as to whether, what floodplain are we talking? Is it established by FEMA or, or was it established a long time before that? And there, it has changed. The floodplains have changed uh, over the years. And, uh, I, you know, if it, if it was not in the floodplain, would this per, would this uh, case be, uh, be be before us now? So, if it were not in the floodplain, as I understand, well, you go ahead, Andy. So, so Mr. Rob, I can attempt to answer your question there. If if the scenario that you suggest had unfolded, if this property had been outside of the flood hazard overlay district and then been amended to be included in the flood hazard overlay district it might be eligible for a legal non-conforming use. As I mentioned to Mr. Shepard, if it were just in the light industrial district, it would require a special use permit. And if it had had a special use permit and then been, and then the flood hazard overlay district had been amended to include this parcel for the first time, it might be established as a legal non-conforming use. I, I don't think that's what the evidence here is though. Well, I. I agree that there's, I, I, that, thank you. You answered my question. So uh, I, I appreciate your answer. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more uh, questions for staff, we can move on and um, I understand the appellant is here. And if there is a presentation from them, we'd be happy to hear it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Steve Blaine representing the appellant and I want to speak to the uh, staff's report and the presentation um, on the um, official determination. But first I want to introduce my clients. 
uh, T. Valentine and John Epley, who own Allied Portable, and just ask them to briefly describe their, their operation. And it may help explain how we uh, found yourselves here today. So John, if you wanna go ahead. Uh, sure, so we, we own Allied Portable Toilets, um, which is you know portable toilet rental business that's been operating in Albemarle County and the surrounding areas for many decades. Um, we're headquartered here, pay our business license and property tax in Albemarle County. Um, most of our customers are contractors doing construction work in the area. Uh, we also do uh, a lot of special events, um, rent toilets to Albemarle County Parks and Recreation Department, as well as City of Charlottesville, um, do all the UVA athletics and graduation and whatnot. Um, we've been leasing this property from the owner since May of 2019. <laughs> Um, who, you know, we, we got to know the owner and, and he offered to, to lease us the property and told us that it's been used uh, as an industrial storage yard uh, prior to that. And um, the reason it's so good for us is I think um, somebody mentioned during the talk uh, is that it's, it's very close to the Moores Creek wastewater treatment plant, which is where everything from the porta potties goes uh, before they get returned to the storage yard clean. So thanks everybody for your consideration. Thank you. So um, with that, to go to the um, the appellant's case, um, I think we agree that um, this would not have been issued a violation if it had not been the flood hazard overlay. The determination has everything to do with the flood hazard overlay district. And so that's why the date of the adoption of that ordinance, which we agree applies to this property in 2014 is a key fact. Uh, we maintain that, however, that it was a legally non-conforming use, um, that it had been operating as a equipment storage yard prior to that date and has continuously since then. And we have the statements uh, of the owners of the property that have indicated that it has continuously been operated for an equipment storage yard for that time period and it has not been discontinued for more than two years. Hmm? I didn't put any the, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Mr. Shepard, did you have a question? I apologize for that. that was... uh, however, where we differ on the presentation is that uh, the uses have been permitted um, in the LI district as a matter of right. And I refer to the code section for the LI district, which is section 26, that allows storage warehousing distribution as a buy right use in the LI. Now, I think where Mr. Herrick was concluding is in the section that refers to heavy equipment and heavy vehicle parking. That would require special use permit. So we differ on the law on that. Now, I think we now have a we have now a new determination. I don't know if, if, we, if we now have to argue that in a separate appeal, but we would maintain that uh, it was legally conforming prior to the floodplain overlay district it, because it complied with the LI district it, as a matter of right. Where it ran into trouble was when the new overlay district was adopted in 2014. And then I think as the uh, staff report indicates, that use continued beyond April of 2014. In the staff report, we, we differ that it ceased operating, but the staff report admits or concedes that it was operating in, at least until December 2014. We believe there was a seasonal suspension of operations, but we had four different operators, four contractors, uh, maintaining an, a, a storage yard at this facility since before uh, 2014. And not until the most recent determination has the county issued any, uh, any notice of violation. Not that that you know, answers the question, but I think we have established that the use at least has been continuously in operation since prior to the adoption of the floodplain overlay district, that's that April 2014 date, uh, as an equipment storage yard. 
where the staff I think is is um, is not correct is the expansion of this notice of violation in 2015. Uh, that is not relevant and does not control this latest determination. This latest determination had to do with whether it complied with the floodplain overlay district. The, the notice of violation in 2014, which is attachment F, if um, I, I can't uh, pull it up on the screen, but it uh, cited the owner at that time for trash, litter, refuse, inoperable vehicles, and mul multiple shipping storage containers. It made no mention of the floodplain overlay district ordinance, even though the, uh, the uh, ordinance had been in effect for, for uh, uh, at least six months. And instead it cited uh, section 13-302, the accumulation of refuge or private on private property. We don't seek to maintain to any refuge or junk on this property. And if they did, Back in 2014, the owner was cited for it. And as the staff report indicates, the owner complied with that and cleaned the site up. We don't uh, propose to keep inoperable vehicles on this site. And there is no reference, the reference there is to section 9 500. Uh, and then the other reference to, um, um, I assume it meant the, the shipping containers referred to uh, 26.2, which is the LI district ordinance. There was no citing of a violation of the ordinance that applies here today in this instance. There's no mention of the floodplain overlay district. Now that's important because as we know, when there is a um, official determination that's a, not appealed, it becomes essentially law. So it's important to make the distinction that that did not control the circumstances today before you. I think it's just been an overstatement. I think it's been helpful to provide a time frame, And we have, as I said, we have the, um, the testimony of the owners that um, it was used this way. It was used by a construction company. It was used by a, um, a logging company to uh, stage their, their logging trailers. Um, so we think that the facts uh, establish a legally non-conforming use. Now, the other point about seeking a zoning clearance, that is not a correct interpretation of the non-conforming use statute, which is uh, 30.3 of the ordinance. That's self-operating. So if you have a non-conforming use and as long as you continue the use um, without discontinuous for two years, you don't have to go down to the county and get a zoning clearance. It might be prudent, it might be wise, but it's not a requirement to maintain a legally uh, uh, conforming, non-conforming use. Every time the county adopts a new restrictive ordinance, we create non-conforming uses we create non-conforming structures all over the place. And I'm sure it's, it's no fun for Ms. Green and uh, Mr. Sabota to have to contend with it. They're very fact-based circumstances. But I think we, we have the facts, um, as I stated, this, to establish the, um, the non-conforming use. We can go to the photographs. I, you know, I think that the... Um, you know, the Google Earth photographs are, are a useful tool, but I think we all know that they're only a snapshot at that day and time. And we're talking about a period that has to extend more than two years for discontinuance. Uh, the first, I think the first two photographs that were shown uh, actually contradict the staff's ma maintaining that there hasn't been a storage use at this property since 2015, since it shows our property. It shows our clients' uh, use but dating back to 2019. Um, I think that there, if, if you wanna, we can go through those, but I think that um, the notion that one photograph, I think the staff, Bart put up a photograph that 
was to represent a period of a year. I mean, that's obviously absurd because it's a photograph taken at one time. We don't have the benefit of time lapse for photography in this presentation, but that's what you would use to rebut um, the point that it was a continuing use. And as I said, we have the testimony that it was, we have the, the leases that show, I mean, a contractor, um, these are all reputable and pretty substantial contractors who, you know, would take this fairly seriously to lease the property uh, and, and to suggest that uh, not one, but not two, not three, but four have leased the property for uh, a, an equipment storage yard without using it, I think is, is, um, is just not, um, just not acceptable. Um, you know, I, I can pause for questions, but I, I guess I would close. I have, a, you know, I have a lot of respect for the zoning administrator's office. I, you know, I worked with Amelia McCulley for over 25 years and, uh, you know, I think they, they mostly get it right. Um, yeah, my regrets here, and I've, you know, had many instances where I've worked with Amelia and, and even in his office, if we knew about a problem or a complaint, the opportunity to address that complaint. And here instead, a receipt of a notice of violation, which really forced my client's hand to have to appeal it. Um, you know, it doesn't preclude uh, us from addressing what, what is the complaint in hand. I, I doubt that the complaint is that this is a use in the floodplain, but um, you know, if anyone can, can uh, you know, illuminate me on that. I'd like to know. Mr. Rob, I think, had a question about, you know, this, the area covered by the ordinance. It was, you know, established based on the FEMA maps, but within the ordinance itself, there is a procedure where an owner can go through. It takes quite a bit of engineering and time. It's a lengthy process, and the owners may want to consider that if this doesn't um, go as we we anticipate, <laughs> uh, but you can prove that it's not actually within a floodplain. Uh, the owners have said that, um, you know, since their ownership of this property, it's never flooded up to the road, uh, you know, and that doesn't say that it's, you know, it's not within the FEMA map, and that's what the ordinance is based upon. We, we, can't, we uh, you know, we have to accept that um, that is a condition, but you know, you if you are familiar with the property, you'll know that there are there are houses on the same side of the road as this use in that neighborhood. And now they may be houses located in the city of Charlottesville, but they're uh, they're not subject to this same ordinance. We we're not suggesting that that's a basis for overturning the determination, but I think it's a I think it's a factor that you ought to consider. My point about the recreational use was not to suggest that that makes it legal. It's to, to demonstrate that we have these portable toilets uh, are ubiquitous. I mean, they're on con con every construction site throughout the county uh, and they're in golf, golf course parks, parks that are all within floodplain at some point. So this, type of use is exists in the floodplain um, and I just think I think that's a um, you know maybe not a policy um, a point but something that we just you know was the point of my appeal so um, with that we'll you know entertain questions if it's appropriate madam chairman and uh, appreciate your consideration thank you mr. Blaine um... Mr. Epley, Mr. Valentine, do you have anything you'd like to add before we um, ask the Board of Zoning Appeals if they have any questions? You good? Not for me. Okay. Not for me. Appreciate everyone's time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask any of the applicants? I have a couple 
some sort of uh, another just clarification about clearances. When a new business uh, starts their business on a site, is a clearance required? Should clearances have been obtained when the when the owners changed hands? So when the parcel changes hands, no. When when the business when a new business, if Bart's restaurant goes to Lisa's restaurant, and a zoning clearance is required under the ordinance. And and just to follow up on that, I'm not aware of whether we obtained a zoning clearance, but it doesn't change the, it doesn't make a use unlawful. A use is either lawful or unlawful as a matter of ordinance. If a, if a tenant, you know, and it's probably uh, violated more in the breach, as they say, um, I would recommend it to any new operator to get a zoning clearance. It's just prudent, but it's just not done all the time, but that doesn't make their use unlawful. It doesn't, you know, it's, they can get called in and maybe they can be fine, but it doesn't render a lawful use unlawful if you don't get a zoning clearance. That's, that's a matter of law. Okay. Okay. I, I appreciate that. I'm just... Uh... Anything else, Mr. Shepard? You good? I'm, uh, I'm not sure what to do with the... Uh discrepancy between the uh, the staff and the appellant's uh, timeline on when the when the parcel has been used or not I'm, uh, I'm not clear in my own mind how that uh, fits in you know how that we should consider that as we uh, consider the idea of whether or not there's a non-conforming use. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you for a minute, and because I'd like to see if anyone else has any questions for Mr. Blaine, because I think that that's an appropriate topic for our, during our discussion. Perfect. Um, yeah. Thank you, John. Um, is there anyone else who has any questions for Mr. Uh, Blaine? Okay, Mr. Rob, what have you got? No, you're mute. I'm interested in determining uh, what what could this matter have been handled? I directed to Mr. Blaine. Could this matter have been resolved without bringing it to the attention of this board? Uh, I appreciate that. I mean, I think that's responding to my my comment. Um, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know because I do think we have, you know, I guess I would ask Mr. Swoboda, I was not aware of the 2014 uh, violation. Um, I, I guess for the reason stated, I don't think it, it's, it's controlling, but I could have been better prepared if I had known about it before the staff report. But um, I, I doubt, I don't think that the staff, this would be a question for staff, uh, consulted the Google Earth or looked at the facts of whether um, there was a non-conforming use. And I'm not saying putting them at fault for that, but on its face, they saw a use that did not conform to the flood overlay district. And that's why really the determination is, is not wrong. Um, but we have, an, we have a defense, if you will, that it's a legally non-conforming use. And perhaps if, um, you know, if we had confronted those facts before the appeal, uh, shown the staff the facts that our owner knew, I mean, we didn't necessarily know until we had to investigate, then maybe we could have um, headed off having to make an appeal um, but I feel like now, and it's, it's human nature that once they have issued the determination and we appeal it, then they had to look for reasons to defend it. And 
you know, it, it could have all been perhaps global, particularly if there were if there were a way to, um, you know, mitigate, um, address a complaint. You know, if the complaint had to do with, uh, you know, trucks starting at 5 a.m., that doesn't have to do with the floodplain ordinance, but that's something an operator can address. Um, if we if we seriously think that a flood, um, you know, could cause injury if a, an empty um, port of john causes a you know some kind of a um, human health risk, there probably is a way to mitigate that. But we really you know didn't have a chance to do that. Um, but I, I have a lot of faith in this body. I've been before this body before, and I've also had good occasion to address, you know, what's the problem? Address the problem in this setting. And I'm prepared to do that. I think my client is too. Do you have anything else, Mr. Rob, that you'd like to ask? We good? No, I, I think that, uh, you know, fa failure to uh, abide by the rules and the laws, the ordinance, because you don't realize that there is a law or ordinance, doesn't excuse the the uh, failure to apply. So, so nor does it it really have anything to do with who made the complaint or who brought it the matter to the attention of the county. Although I think Mr. Burkert's question was very, very uh, direct and very uh, insightful. Uh, I, I'm just, you know, it, it just seems to me that this matter could have been resolved without going to this, this position. But I'm, I'm not questioning whether or not they, there is a violation. That's, and that's what I'm here to question. So, no, I have nothing further to say. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions for Mr. Blaine? Okay, if that's the case, we will open the public hearing. Uh, Ms. Alley, can you tell me if there's anyone from the public that you know of that would like to speak on this? Yes, we currently have um, one person signed up for speaking on this item. Uh, currently, I do not see any additional hands being raised to sign up. For those of you in the attendees um, area, if you are interested in signing up to speak on this item, please indicate by raising your hand. And we'll give you a few seconds to do that. And um, we can move from there, but we do have one person, Andrew Dean. While we're waiting, would you like for me to go ahead and read the meeting guidelines for public speaking? That would be wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Alley. Certainly. Following information is provided to help ensure the meeting proceeds as efficiently and effectively as possible. As a courtesy to others, please turn off all unused cell phones during the meeting. This meeting is being recorded and will be later transcribed into minutes approved at a later meeting date. Each item Set for public hearing, we'll begin with the presentation of the staff report. The next applicant or appellant for that item will be invited to speak. During the course of the process, the chairman, chair, will open the public hearing to comments from the public. At the end of these proceedings, the chair will announce that the public hearing is closed. Once the public hearing is closed, no further pub public comments will be allowed unless the BZA asks for additional information from the applicant or appellant. For staff and applicants, there is a 15 minute time limit for presentations and a five minute time limit for rebuttal comments. The BZA reserves the right to digress from these guidelines in any particular case. For members of the public, if you wish to address the BZA during the public hearing, please, allow, please follow the instructions. Log in. If you are joining via the web, use the raise hand icon to notify the clerk that you'd like to sign up. The clerk will acknowledge you and list your name on the sign-up sheet. 
If you are joining via phone, press star nine to notify the clerk that you would like to sign up and your name as well will be added to the sign up sheet. If you do not sign up to speak prior to the meeting, an opportunity will be given prior to the close of the public hearing. This opportunity is announced. When this opportunity is announced, follow the directions as, a, as listed and you will be added to that item for public speaking. Timekeeping is conducted through a timer and each speaker is allotted three minutes to comment. The timer will commence when you begin speaking and you will be notified when three minutes has ended. You are requested to bring your comments to a close as your microphone will be muted after several seconds. In order to give all speakers equal treatment and courtesy, the BZA requests that speakers adhere to the following guidelines. When called to address the BZA, please state your name. For uncommon spellings, please spell your name for the record. Address comments directly to the BZA as a whole. Open public debate is prohibited. You may also provide written statements or other relevant material by email to the Board of Zoning Appeals at albemarle.org. If you represent a group or organization, you may identify your group. If you exceed your allotted time, you will be asked to end your comments and the microphone will be muted. If a speaker does not use all of their allotted time, the unused time may not be shared with another speaker. Speakers are permitted one opportunity to comment during each public comment period per meeting. Additional guidelines for applicants and appellants addressing the board understand that the BZA cannot change county ordinances. The BZA reserves the right to place additional time limitations on speakers as necessary. Uh, currently, we still have no other speakers signed up. So Andrew Dean is our only speaker for this item. Thank you. Have you, I don't see the name coming up yet. It is going to be 2276. Okay. Mr. Dean? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, yes, my name is Andrew Dean. I've owned and lived at an adjoining property at 801 Franklin Street in Charlottesville City since February 2016, in contrast to 801 Franklin being in Almar County. Currently, there's just a couple opening comments. Uh, currently, there's standing water in the middle of the parking area of 801 Franklin. If there's any, you know, uh, question of whether or not that place floods, it definitely does. It currently is. Uh, you can smell the hundreds of porta potties from within my home, from within my office right now. You can smell it. Uh, my proper property is also at a higher elevation, and I have to pay for flood insurance each year uh, since my property is indeed in a flood zone. Just a couple. Uh, so let me get into it. Um, since January 2020, I've owned and operated an IT security consulting firm practicing lead engineering and architecture that directly protects central global infrastructure for companies like my current customer, Warner Brothers Discovery, as well as clear high security networks containing military aviation data for companies that work with U.S. national defense, such as GE. Uh, without going into too many technical details, large mistakes while working with these technologies I lead architecture work on can lead to completely locked out of all infrastructure due to the highly secure way that assets and accounts are vaulted in these systems, which would be disastrous, millions if not billions in damages and national media coverage. Just last month, I drove an upgrade of a huge vault system that required working 40 hours straight with a five hour break for a shower and a nap. So why did I explain all that? My job is very stressful and uh, relatively, and given all that and the highly detail oriented nature of the work of working with these ridiculously complex systems, rest is very important to me in my job. I'm very seriously affected by excess noise. So let me get into um, the meat of this. When I first moved into this house, the neighborhood was very exceptionally quiet, being on the very edge of the city, very, very edge. Um, you know, several years back, Allied Portable Toilets, we've in 2019 began storing porta potties in the parking lot of 801 Franklin Street. From then until now, storage capacity has drastically increased. And there's a human waste order, uh, odor now within my property. It's also a constant cigarette smoke within my house that I've had to put in air purifiers on all of my floors just to make it livable in here. On average, three times per week, I'm woken up between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. by loud bassy music, workers loudly shouting across the parking lot of 801 Franklin Street, vehicle backup warning alarms, loud banging that sounds like an apartment dumpster being emptied, all coming from this parking lot, mostly between the hours of 4 and 6, sometimes earlier, uh, sometimes as early as 2 in the morning. The music is usually sustained for more than 5 to 10 minutes, kind of as if they're arriving to work with coffee, talking to coworkers, loud enough to shake the windows in my bedroom, which faces this area. 
causing noise over 55 decibels to enter residential zone between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. is considered a violation of Charlotte School City Code. Just so you know, 70 decibels is described by Yale University as a normal conversation. These codes exist to protect the health of Charlottesville residents and ensure a decent living environment as possible. Allied Portable Toilets has been repeatedly notified that the noise they're creating is causing disturbance in the neighborhood and affecting the health of the residents around them, and still refuses to acknowledge this and continues to cause an unreasonable and unlawful amount of noise to enter Charlottesville City before 6 a.m. So to me, look, it's obvious Allied Portable Toilets is repeatedly breaking the law, refusing to respect the neighborhood they're operating in, in addition, to the fact that they're knowingly storing toxic waste in a flood zone, despite the serious public health and safety concerns that this causes. I'd ask the Board of Zoning Appeals to please, please consider the health of the people occupying the Charlottesville residen residential zones around 801 Franklin Street with your decision today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, Ms. Alley, is there anyone else that would like to speak to the BCA? Currently, there are no hands raised. Okay, if that is the case, then we will close the public hearing. And at this point, um, does the staff or the county attorney have any closing remarks they'd like to make? So Madam Chair, just briefly, there are a couple points of, of Mr. Blaine's presentation that I wanted to address. Uh, first of all, whether or not this is a buy right use in the light industrial district. Uh, if you look at the regulations for light industrial district and county code section 18-26.2, the variety of different types of storage that are mentioned in the light industrial district. Um, the only one that is allowed by right is temporary construction storage yards. So if it's a temporary yard, it is allowed by right in the light industrial district. However, every other variety of a storage yard is only by special use permit uh, in the Lone industrial district. Uh, the other point I wanted to address that Mr. Blaine raised was the relevance of the 2014 violation. As Mr. Blaine acknowledged, uh, there were three violations actually mentioned in the 2014 violation letter. The middle one of those, number two, had to deal with the use not permitted in the light industrial district under the same code section that I just cited, 18-26.2. Um, so I would agree that to Mr. with Mr. Blaine to the extent that uh, that finding isn't necessarily binding on the uh, BZA today. However, I, th I think the importance of it is um, that what came out of that violation was an abatement of that violation. In other words, when they were cited for a use not permitted, even in the light industrial district, the owner responded by abating that violation. And I think that's additional evidence that the use has been discontinued. Um, obviously, the county doesn't have aerial photos of every single day uh, uh, of the eight years since 2014. However, I think the representative sample uh, of the uh, uh, aerial photos that the county has has established um, that uh, the use was discontinued for more than two years. And again, I would remind the BZA that the burden of proof to establish a legal non-conforming use is in fact on the applicant rather than on the county. Um, so those are the points that I wanted to address that, that Mr. Blaine had raised. I, I think that the, um, uh, that the um, notice of violation from 2014 is relevant. And I, and I agree again with Mr. Svoboda that the determination, uh, the more recent determination is correct and should be affirmed. Thank you. Um, Mr. Svoboda, Ms. Green, you have anything else you'd like to add? I don't have anything to add. Okay. Okay, at that, at that point then, um, if the applicant would like a rebuttal, um, is there anything that you'd like to say at this point? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, the interpretation of the LI ordinance, um, we disagree with. And uh, I'll note for the record that we have a new uh, determination. That was not a determination that was made uh, that's subject of this appeal. Um, so it's not correct and it's not appropriate for the consideration today. Uh, in terms of the photographs, we have, we have testimony of the owners that has been continuously used and not discontinued for more than two years. We have leases to show that not one, not two, but four contractors have used the lot for uh, equipment storage. And um, the, yeah, I, I, 
I, we would maintain that in the without um, direct specific contrary evidence that our evidence uh, meets the burden of proof. Is there anything else? Anyone else on? Um, well, we've had Mr. Blaine speak to the applicants. Um, Mr. Valentine, um, I can't find you anymore. Mr. Epley, is there anything that you'd like to say? Uh, I would just say that we're we're aware of um, Mr. Dean's issues with uh, with noise, and we've been trying to work with him for many many months. Um, and there, there, it's there's a there's a whole story there with Charlottesville Police Department involved on both sides. It really doesn't have very much to do with zoning, but we we've tried to make ourselves uh, very good neighbors, and, and he's really the only neighbor that we're aware of that that has an issue. Okay. Oh, I did I did have a question for my client. Can you confirm that there is no effluent or chemical stored in these? Right. That's that's ab that's absolutely false. Um, the the waste is is dumped at the Moores Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, we're a regulated business that's regulated by the Virginia Department of Health. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Okay, I think we will bring this back up to the. BZA members for discussion. Um, Mr. Burkhart, is there anything that you'd like to add to this discussion or do you have any questions? What are you thinking? I, are you on, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, thoughts, obviously, and I'd like to hear uh, from fellow board members as well. I know that um, uh, in the uh, last case that we just uh, went through, there was uh, consideration given to obviously a resident, and I don't know what impacts uh, a non-resident of Albemarle County has on on an operation which is within the jurisdiction of the county. Um, so I. I, I uh, well, I, 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 I can't, um, you know, get someone to validate or corroborate the, the discussion that we just heard from the resident. It was still nonetheless, uh, uh, I think, uh, very impactful to hear. Um, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, again, um, the activities that had continued on this property. And, uh, and, and while this company um, has continued to operate and, and, and lease, I mean, in the statement that, that we all received this uh, uh, statement by the appellant, uh, <clears throat> age and a half here, it's mentioned twice in there that they have rented uh, port porta potties uh, with the county, um, Mr. Blaine talked about it was the Department of Parks and Recreation. I'm just curious whether or not, you know, they they continue to do business, knowing that there had been a um, a complaint uh, uh, initiated here and uh, an action taken. Uh, so so right now I've just got a lot of things uh, kind of um, swirling around. I'm trying to put some priority in in all of this, and so I'd like to get, get the benefit from uh, fellow board members on their comments. Thank you, Mr. Burkhart. Um, Mr. Shepard, you had mentioned that you were interested in, in some aspect of this. Do you wanna go ahead and elaborate? Embarrassed to say, I don't remember the point I was on the verge of making, but uh, I, I, will, I would like to, to start by saying this is, this is not a conclusion, I haven't come to a conclusion here, but uh, something that has confused me as I was looking at this, and I can see that both what Mr. Herrick said and what Mr. Blaine said, I think are, are different, uh, are looking at the use differently. Uh, I don't remember the exact citations, but one route into the ordinance says, uh, I think it's called 
is a contractor's storage yard or just storage yard. And that in the LI district requires you to go to, to see, uh, I think you're, you're into HC and that shows, that indicates that that use requires a special permit. And then there's another use listed in the ordinance that's, that includes the word like warehousing, trucks, storage, uh, and the like. And I think that is not permitted in LI. Uh, but it's, like I said, I don't, I, I don't have this on the tip of my tongue, but there's a discrepancy there. And as we delve into this, I would like to have that sort of clarified so we can, I don't know if we could come to an agreement on whether this is a by right or an SP right or not, but that's troubling me at the moment. I think it's something that Mr. Herrick spoke to. Um, Mr. Herrick, do you want to go back over that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the, the term contractor storage yard is one that's not used in either the LI regulations or in the flood hazard overlay uh, regulations. Um, that's why I was distinguishing earlier that the temporary construction storage yard is the only type of storage that's allowed by right in the light industrial district. All other types of storage, and again, none of them are explicitly called contractor storage yard. It's, it's storage yards of various types, and every other one of them in the LI requires uh, a special use permit. Um, but then again, the, the, the type of storage that's at issue here is what's allowed or not allowed in the flood hazard overlay district. And there's simply no type of storage that's allowed in the flood hazard overlay district. If you look at those regulations, um, it explicitly, storage is not a permitted use that's on, is not on the list of permitted use in the flood hazard overlay district. Is, is that helpful, Mr. Shepard? It is helpful for me. I mean, I, uh, what, I'm, what I'm looking for here is uh, a history of storage uses being fully vetted and permitted on this property as that would be part of a establishing a, a non-conforming uh, argument and I haven't found it yet. Okay, Mr. Carrington. Yeah, I would love to jump in because I was um, tracking with Mr. Shepard on that. I think it's an interesting conversation to figure out what type of use this actually is, because based on what I'm looking at in the code, it looks like there is a storage yard, which has a definition, and a storage slash warehousing slash distribution slash transportation. And I think I also track with Mr. Shepard in trying to understand, uh, you know, which, which use we're talking about here, um, which may be applicable to the question of whether or not it's by right or not, I think the storage slash warehousing slash distribution slash transportation, I, th I think is shown as BR by right in the light industrial district. Um, but I think maybe, maybe to put a finer point on it, I think the board would do better to say whether it is a storage slash warehousing uh, or a storage yard, the fact is that it doesn't really matter in this case because the county's opinion, I think, is that the use is a violation because it is in the flood hazard overlay district, not because it's a storage slash warehousing slash distribution versus a storage yard. So I think, I think we would do well to establish that it is, regardless of which use it is, it doesn't really matter, even though one of them may be by right. The question we need to decipher, I think, is whether or not this has been a non-conforming use over time that has continued and not stopped for two years. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? I will add one more thing. I know Mr. Blaine wants to jump in. I, I, I think that the attempt to tie the 2014 zoning violation notice into this case is fairly flimsy because it doesn't mention anything about a storage use or a storage slash or housing slash distribution slash transportation use being 
the violation that's occurring within the flood hazard overlay district. So to say that it hasn't, that it became a matter decided, which is what it says in the staff report, I just I don't think that's really relevant. So I'm having trouble tying those two things together. If you look back at the that letter of October 28th, 2014, um, the first item that's issued that was observed is the trash. The second is um, multiple storage containers. The third is inoperable vehicles. And then below that, it cites what the violation is in the code. And the first one has to do with accumulation of refuse. And then the second one has to do with permitted primary and accessory uses and structures, prohibited uses and structures in the industrial districts. But I, I agree with you that there's no reference to floodplain. There's no reference to that aspect. Um, so I, I guess that's where um, I, I'm with you on that, trying to figure out how, how it is that, that, they're, that, that they're connected. So, um, but um, anything else? No? Okay. Mr. Rob, what are you thinking? Got anything else for us? Well, the, the, the simple explanation that I can see, put it in very simple terms. It's a question of, is it a violation of the floodplain or not? And really no other picture here. And that's what I get from Mr. Herrick. And uh, I really have nothing further to, to add to that. Yeah, the, the floodplain ordinance came about in 2014. And I guess what we're all trying to figure out is this an established use that's been in continued use um, prior to 14 and since 14. That's part my, of it. My, my statement would be that it doesn't make any difference. Uh, they're either in violation of the floodplain situation or they're not. Mr. Herrick has, has made the argument the same uh, in uh, much better legal terms than what I do, but uh, that's the way I see it. Okay. M Mr. Herrick, can I ask you a question about the ordinance? Yes, ma'am. The ordinance, um, this floodplain ordinance speaks to the fact, I think I'm reading it correctly, that if there was a use that was in operation prior to the 2014 date, that they would be considered non-conforming and not subject to this floodplain ordinance? Um, so uh, County Code Section 18-30.3.3D, any use or development lawfully existing on April 2nd, 2014 shall be non-conforming to the extent that it is not in compliance with Section 30.3, which is the Flood Hazard Overlay District. So yes, if it was in operation prior to and continued in operation since that date, it would be considered non-conforming as of today. That's correct. It would have to be established as of that date and then continue without being discontinued for at least two years uh, subsequent to that date. So it could, have, it could have been established as of that date and then lose its legal nonconforming status if it didn't maintain it. Uh, but yes, um, that's correct. That it would have to be established prior to that date. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions for staff or comments? Um, from any BZA members, are we ready to take action on this? Anybody? I'm just, um, I'm uncomfortable with the timeline of the uses on the site since 2014. Just because we have conflicting testimony, it's hard to sift through that because it's 
in some ways it really that's what it hinges on and it's hard i'm having trouble uh, come to a final conclusion um Madam, Madam Chair, I, I, I think if that is the pleasure of the BZA, that they wish to drill down to the um, to the timing, because that is essential to our case, because we don't disagree, Mr. Rob, that this use would not be permitted under the floodplain <laughs> ordinance, but for the fact that it is a non-conforming use. And Mr. Herrick correctly identified the statute that says that if it was existing on the date of the adoption and continued without discontinuance, then it's a legally non-conforming use. So that's why these fact, this is a very fact-based situation. It's not, I don't believe it's gonna set precedent throughout the county. Um, we can go through the timeline, but we have uh, evidence that it was leased to Summit Construction uh, that they had that through the end of September of 2015. Um, we don't have any lease in place, and I don't have any direct testimony that it was used between that date and uh, August of 2017, but that would still be less than two years um, that it was discontinued. And in 2017, we have evidence that Boxley Quarry uh, used it for an equipment and storage yard. Uh, then uh, Boxley Quarry left, and in 2018, we have uh, Tapscott Logging coming in. So there's, there is evidence, both the owner's testimony and evidence, you know, I'd love to have time-lapse photography, but I would maintain that those photographs that are labeled March through, you know, 2020 through whatever, that's one photograph, okay? And there's no dispute in those photographs that it was being used after, uh, uh, what was it, May 2019, because our clients were using it. So we can establish up until then it was being used. Um, and we just happen to have one or two photographs. There's a gap in the photographs too. There's a gap from uh, 2016 to 2017 or to 2018. Why didn't staff provide a photograph in 2017? Well, maybe Google Maps didn't have one. I'm not saying that they'll hit the ball, but that is an imperfect um, method to establish the continuity that we need. It's evidence clearly, and it's the best that the county has. But we have direct countervein evidence, and we have. Um, you know, paperwork to back it up. Mr. Blaine, the, the paperwork that you provided for us, and you, you have spoken a couple of times about testimony, but I have never seen anything written with somebody's um, signature that says, I testify that this was used on these and these dates and, and, and some sort of signed, almost like an affidavit. I, I, I can testify to this. I mean, your, your people have talked to you, but we have heard only your words. And the information that you sent, I mean, I think it's great that somebody got $5,400, but I don't know what they were doing there. Um, it, it's, it, there's nothing here, it talks about leasing, but there's nothing related to the use on this. With the Boxley paper that you sent us, um, we know what the rental rate was, but nobody signed it. I mean, there's, there's nothing, there's, there's not a signed document here. Um, so, and this was in 2017. So I guess what I'm, I'm asking you is the other lease agreement um, with the Tapscott brothers, again, there's nothing really related to the use on here. It's just talking about how much they're going to pay. So if you could get testimony from people that said, from Tapscott or whoever, yes, we used it for this. Yes, we stored this. Yes, we did this. That that might be helpful also, because right now I'm just looking at paper that, that really doesn't tell me anything except that somebody paid somebody money for something. I think those are valid points. I mean, we, we haven't sought to impeach the evidence that the county has submitted in terms of photographs. I haven't asked for a date stamp or a primary, but I think it's their valid questions. Um, 
there is a letter from the owner signed by Mr. Fields, who's in very poor health and is not, not able to attend these meetings. He signed a letter that says that it's been in continuous operation. And, and in his words, um, they weren't abandoned, but we don't use that in the statute. But clearly, he has gone uh, in a letter and said that it's been in continuous use. Um, the, these folks are, you know, Mr. Miss, Mrs. Field is now deceased. Mr. Fields is in very poor health. His daughter, who has um, been the bookkeeper, who I spoke to, is his primary caregiver. The son, you know, he's a working person. He was, uh, you know, cutting hay today. I, I gave him the, the phone number to please implore him to call in, and he, you know, was uncomfortable, apparently. I can't compel these witnesses. Uh, I, there's some authority that that indicates that the BZA may compel them. I've never had to do that. But, you know, if you're suggesting that we adjourn this matter and bring witnesses in, I'm happy to do that. I think we have the facts behind us. I just think that, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not a mark on Bard or his office, but um, I, I think this whole thing now looking at photographs is meant to justify a determination that we now have a defense of. But to Mr. Rob's point, we're not arguing that this use meets the floodplain ordinance. We're arguing that it's, it's, it's grandfather. That's the, you know, the common term. So I just want to be clear what we're, you know, what you're deciding. But if there's, uh, if there's, if you want more, you know, people on the Bible, you know, <laughs> if that's what it takes, I've never, you know, I, I don't know why uh, I didn't question them when I asked questions about the use um, and they seem to have an answer for everything. You know, why isn't this, <laughs> why isn't this sign? You know, I would, I would have a signed copy too. Well, we sent the sign one back to them. You know, <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's the best, it's the best that we have, but it's genuine. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's credible because it's genuine. These are genuine people. No, I, I certainly understand what you're talking about with a snapshot in time also with a Google photo. I do understand that. Um, and I'd like to hear from the rest of the BCA what their thoughts are on this. Is everybody else okay with with the information that's been submitted, uh, Mr. Rob? What I go back to the floodplain definition, and maybe uh, Mr. Harry can do. Was there a floodplain there twenty years ago? Was there a floodplain there fifty years ago? Was there a floodplain there in twenty four in twenty fourteen? So, um, Mr. I don't know exactly when the boundaries of the flood hazard overlay district were established in this particular location. Again, I imagine if there had been a change in the flood hazard overlay district here, the applicant would be making the case to you today that the that the boundary line had changed at that time and that they were legal, legally legally non conforming on that basis. Uh, give, given the fact that the applicant isn't raising that argument, I'm assuming. Uh, that the flood hazard overlay district has remained constant in this location since before 2014. Yeah. So, so the question go back to, and maybe Mr. Bowling can handle it. The question goes back to what is our charge here? What's the charge of this commission? Uh, the Boning Board of Zoning Appeals, what's our charge? It's just to find out whether or not we agree with the decision that was made by the, uh, the zoning department of, it, of Albemarle County, which was a violation or not of the floodplain ordinance. Mr. Bowling, what have you got? Uh, well, I, I just want to reiterate that Mr. Carrington and Mr. Shepard have phrased the issue precisely. That is the issue is whether you have a non-conforming uh, use here or has the non-conforming use gone away? Right. Um, and Eric has pointed out that the burden of proof is on the applicant to prove that, and that the uh, uh, the staff's uh, conclusion is entitled to the uh, 
correctness, if you want to call it that. But uh, to get to uh, your chairman's point, uh, the evidence is messy. Um, um, I don't think we were going to get into the weeds as much as we, we have ended up doing today. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that there are other uh, uh, Google uh, dates and time, which other than those pictures that the county provided us, um, and I'm assuming also that Mr. Blaine can produce uh, um, affidavits to uh, satisfy your concern, Madam Chairman, which are rightfully raised. Uh, there's, uh, I just, I think that the, the the difficulty in resolving the question is that the the evidence that you're trying to do it on right now. Um, the reason for some uncertainty, perhaps, that some of you have is because it's uncertain. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Ms. Joseph, I, um, you know, I'm starting to compartmentalize a bit and you know, I think it's helpful for me to see the Google Earth imagery provided in our packet from 2013 that shows activity on the site. I, I presume it's some sort of storage or storage slash warehousing uh, type use. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that, that checks the box that there was a use in 2013 <clears throat> that predated the overlay district, the flood hazard overlay district. And so, you know, I think the board would do well to narrow down our question of whether or not that use stopped for two years in between 2013 or rather 2014, since that's when the overlay district was enacted and today. I think that's what all of this conversation boils down to. Right, and, and in support of that, there is the letter from Mr. Falls um, way back in, in the packet that talks about the fact that um, he's owned it since 1980 and it's he's been it's the local projects supported by this use have been involved have involved reputable companies such as Summit, Slurry and Boxley. So I guess that's what um, Mr. Blaine was talking about in what else do we want other than will this letter do it as far as making us feel more comfortable that this that this is like an affidavit this is testimonial from someone who says the owner who says that this has been used for this um Oh, sorry, John. Mr. Shepard. Um, I don't want to, well, I wonder, uh, I, I want to resolve this today. I don't want to dodge the responsibility. It's all front of mind and I don't, I want to complete this. But I'm also, I have a uh, second, you know, I, I have other thoughts about it. I'm wondering, did the staff have the chance to examine the, the information we're looking at now, uh, or is this new to you all also? I mean, it's hard for us, I mean, put it this way, it, it's hard for me, uh, I, I, would, I would like, I would, I wonder if maybe we should defer this for, on the point of to have staff, uh, examine the information that they that Mr. Blaine has provided and also uh, and at the same time could bolster their uh, maybe their findings that the uh, the timeline does have 
two year gaps in it. Uh, if this is uh, if if this is what it takes to establish the the nonconformity question, uh, I would certainly like to be able to do it with uh, information that uh, with facts that are agreed to by both sides, if that can happen. Might be a little late in the day to be talking about a deferral, but uh, that's what I'm thinking at the moment. Mr. Carrington, you just came off mute. Do you wanna add something to that? I guess my only point would just be that, you know, I find the evidence that's been submitted to be fairly strong in a case that, you know, goes back lots of years. Um, you know, do we have an affidavit that's notarized? No, but um, I don't know, you know, at some level, 2014 was a long time ago. And I think the fact that these paper records have been uh, uncovered is pretty amazing, to be honest. Um, I think it suggests that it's, it's been a use that's been continuous, okay. is, is my feeling. Okay. Mr. Burkhart, what do you think? Well, I, I, I tend to be in agreement with both, uh, both, uh, both gentlemen here. Um, I would, I, I, if I were asked to vote, which is obviously on the agenda today, I, I, I probably uh, would have a very hard time because there are still pieces missing. And I'd very much like to see uh, one last effort uh, on the part of the appellant uh, um, uh, appeal here to uh, secure um, additional documentation, which has been, and, and, and the chair, you alluded to that quite, quite aptly in your comments um, about uh, what you'd like to see. Um, so I, 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 for one, would like to uh, defer, defer this until the next meeting and give, uh, give at least a, 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 period of time for um, uh, the appellants uh, and their counsel to come up with uh, what you have suggested. Um, and then, then, we, then we have our uh, last best effort to really resolve this uh, uh, because I agree uh, um, with the statements that have been made that it's uh, a question about the non-conforming use uh, and, and from when that began. Uh, but then we've got the floodplain overlay district, which is uh, is certainly of huge concern and uh, sort of trumps um, uh, the the uh, light industrial. Um, so again, I'd, I'd like just a little more information. I just don't feel that I could give a vote one way or the other today, to be honest. Thank you. Mr. Rob, what do you think? Would it help? I have, I have no further... Uh comments related to it I, I'm inclined to uh, to go along with uh, what the other four members uh, suggest okay would would it be helpful for you to get more information it wouldn't be har harmful okay thank you thank you um, Mr. Shepard. Well, uh, I can only repeat myself. Is there a question for me? The repeat yourself would, you would like more information. Is yes. that correct? All right. So you're there. So we've got Mr. Burkhart. Um, got Mr. Stipulation. What's uh, that? uh, I, I really, I, I want the staff to comment, to examine and uh, incorporate their examination of the history that the appellant is showing and, uh, and then report back to us on their findings. I mean, I, I want it to be incorporated into uh, a staff report. It's, it's not just that, uh, you know, I would like to, I would like to, for us to agree on the facts. Uh, and so that means sort of, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that 
uh, with further, you know, just communication between staff and the appellant that uh, the facts can be established and agreed upon. I hope that can happen. Otherwise, we'll pick a side and we'll vote. But uh, well, one of the things Mr. Herrick said is is that it's up to the appellant to provide us with with information. It's not necessarily up to staff to provide us with with, but it certainly is problem is up to staff to to help analyze what comes in. So that that's all I want to clarify. Mr. Rob, you got your hand up again on purpose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have a purpose. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Herrick, Mr. Payne, Blaine, uh, just very simple terms. What are we talking about the use or are we talking about a violation of the floodplain? ordinance. What are we talking about? Or are we talking about both? If I, I want to be convinced that it's more than a question of a, of a violation of the floodplain. But I'm, I'm willing to, to go along with whatever uh, develops related to, to the information. Just convince me that it's more than the, than the floodplain issue. Well, Mr. Rob, I think Mr. Carrington was correct when when he thought uh, when he stated that the issue really boils down to whether uh, the use has been discontinued, whether it was established as of April 2014, and whether it's been uh, continuously used since that time. I, I think that that's ultimately what the determination is. Um, and before the the BZA considers making a deferral in this case, I'd point out that state law requires the BZA to render its decision within 90 days. Um, so that if the BZA is inclined to make a deferral, I believe that deferral should be at the applicant's or at the appellant's request. And I think that that request should be on the record so that it's clear that in the event that the BZA doesn't reach its decision within 90 days, it was because the applicant made that request. Mr. Blaine, you're, you're on here. Um, would you like to respond to that? Well, I, you know, I should maybe look to my clients. Um, it, it's important that the decision is the right decision to them. Um, and if the um, BZA, uh, you know, feels like more, um, more facts can come forward, we'll, um, I, I would recommend that we defer. I think it's a fact, a fact-based decision. I, I, you know, I think the facts are there to make a decision, but I'm sensing that there's some discomfort, and it would be imprudent to force the issue. I believe. Mr. Epley, Mr. Valentine, would you like to respond to that? Um, I, I would just. I, I, would I agree with. Uh, with Steve and then also with Mr. Carrington, I mean, I, I think that we have presented evidence that the property has been in continuous use since before 2014, and it hasn't been interrupted for more than 24 months at a time um, with written, you know, a written letter from our landlord, as well as these leases, which really weren't very easy to track down. Um, and so like, if, I'm not hearing that anyone is actually like disagreeing with us um, that they think that there was an interruption of more than 24 months. Um, so I guess that's my two cents. I think what you're hearing from me is that I don't know. I think that what you were hearing from Mr. Burkhart is it was hard for him to make a decision right now um, so that's, but it's honestly, it, it's, it's up to you guys to make the decision on whether you'd like to, um, defer yeah, this. I, I, if I, I guess I would just want to ask what, um, like what evidence would, would make it 
more compelling um would a would a like an affidavit we can get mr falls to sign one would that be helpful um what, what would be an acceptable level of comfort for the bza in terms of proof we're, we're 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 more than happy to roll up our sleeves and get what needs to be produced i understand the burden of proof is on you but my actual question is or my hesitation is i want to i'm interested in the staff's review of the non-conforming question uh and in, you know to have that incorporated into our decision i haven't heard you know i, I don't i haven't heard an analysis you know the staff's analysis of the timeline really beyond the photographs which was not uh i believe the photos were true on the days that they were taken or those periods of time but that's not a compelling argument for me so it's in some ways i'm not sure how much more speaking personally i'm not sure how much more you can provide uh it's the trying to get an agreement more if it's if it's possible to agree on the facts that would be great and that's what I'm hoping for. Hope that's clear. Uh, and inside the, the proper uh, boundaries here. Yeah, I was just gonna jump in and, and John, I think I'm tracking with some of that as well. <clears throat> it's interesting to note that a snapshot in time um, does not serve, I think the board uh, has been consistent today. A snapshot in time, a Google image that is a snapshot uh, is not going to be very helpful in establishing that a use has has stopped for two years, right? There's just no way we can have a snapshot of every day in between now and 2014. And, and yet on the applicant side, a snapshot in time, a receipt, a lease, um, a document, I mean, those snapshots go a lot farther to establishing and restarting that two-year clock. Um, so maybe, Again, I, I would say what, what more, as a board, what more do we want? Um, Ms. Joseph has, has said maybe a you know, signed document or a, a notarized document or something like that. I, 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 we're gonna I, defer I, this, let's figure out what we want. I'm not even necessarily has to be notarized. Can you get a note from Summit that says what they were doing on the site? Can you get a note from Slurry that says what they were doing on the site? I mean, that's all I'm looking for, or, or Boxley. What, what was Boxley doing? Um, it's just a note from them saying that, um, because this, this Tapscott logging, what were you doing there, Tapscott logging? What were, you, were you storing stuff there? What were you doing? That's all, that's all I'm interested in, because when I see these, it's, it's, it's nice that they were paid. And I think it's wonderful Mr. Falls has written this note, but it would just add to my comfort zone to just have them saying what they were doing there and a date. I was there in 2018. I was there in 2016. I was there in 2013. Um, those sorts of things I think would, would help me establish the fact that this has been in continuous operation because in staff's defense, they don't go around looking. I mean, one of the things Mr. Rob asked is, it, or no, Mr. Mr. Who asked? Somebody asked, do you go and inspect these? And, you know, we know that, that there aren't enough inspectors to go around and take a look and see what's happening in anything. So they only, they only go out when there's a complaint. So um, I guess that's what I'm just looking for is, is one more level that I'll feel that I am, I'm doing my job well that I've, I've received enough information that I feel comfortable. So that, that's all I'm thinking. And Mr. Blaine, um, Mr. Epley, and Mr. Valentine, if you've heard me, those, those are just the things. I don't expect you to go out and drag somebody to, to notarize something. I'm just thinking, tell us what they were doing. Get a, get a note from them or write the note yourself if they tell you and just get them to sign it. Just something like that. Um, just just a little bit more evidence that this has been in use. A question, Madam Chair. Um, 
Okay, so Mr. Herrick, you mentioned that uh, there's a statutory timeline. Um, the uh, the appellant filed a timely appeal on May 27th. So uh, what's the drop dead date here? August 27th. July, August. It's coming up. All right, so it would be within 90 days of when the applicant filed the appeal. I think I heard somebody suggest that was August 27th. It would be before the regular <laughs> September meeting. So again, that would, that would be... If the board were to defer it, it should be at the request of the uh, appellant. And it would be, and it would be this this month, obviously, since we're in August. And uh, I think the chair has done an excellent job, sort of uh, uh, articulating uh, what what this board would like to see. Um, beyond that, I, I I think that's a a pretty good uh, shopping list for the appellant to produce. Um, uh, it, it would uh, would the would Mr. Herrick prefer to have something a little more formalized rather than just a note with uh, someone's signature, or would you like to have that notarized? I, I'm not ultimately that makes the decision as to, um, you know, what's persuasive evidence for the board. That would be up to the board to decide what it found persuasive. All right. And the problem I have is I haven't heard the applicants willing to uh, right. uh, express this uh, right. referral. We just, we have, we have no relationship with these with these tenants, and so committing to being able to get their notarized signatures before August twenty seventh is unknowable. So the, oh, yeah, they're not the question the question oh. is yeah for the client we you know we have an opportunity to try um, if we make a request a deferral. That's not to say that you know we're going to be successful in getting any more evidence, but. Um, that would be your decision or, um, you know, we feel like we have uh, better evidence than the county and we can ask the BCA to, to make a decision. I, I think we have better evidence um, than the county and that, that meets the burden. So there, we've got the owner, we've got the owner on, on a letter and we have paperwork that you know you just can't make this stuff up <laughs> um so that's really your your call it, yeah like one one anecdote is i'm just looking at summit construction is headquartered in ohio and leased this i'm assuming for a storage yard or storage transportation yard when they were doing a project in this area so i don't know i don't know what we'll be able to get by august 27th you, you if you defer this item it doesn't go before us on August 27th. It may go before us in September if we decide upon a date, but you wouldn't have to get it by August 27th. And you're in violation, you're still allowed. Once you get this letter, it doesn't stop you from using the site, right? They can continue to use the, okay, Bart, Mr. Yeah, yeah, so and and either Mr. Blaine or Mr. Herrick can jump in, but with the pending appeal, it sort of stays all the enforcement action. Okay, so that's where we are. So if you decide to defer, um, then we would commit to that stays the enforcement ash, action as we as we work through this. So if there's information that we need to review with with. Mr. Valentine or Mr. Epley or Mr. Blaine to, to figure out what that burden is, um, then, then that's where we are. Because where we are right now is their snapshot in time that's paper and our snapshot in time that's photographic just indicates, um, you know, kind of those things. So how do we reconcile that is what I'm, what I'm hearing from the board. So if September is not a timely date and October is a more timely date. That would still stay enforcement action until this matter is resolved. So, so as far as the, there's a deadline in the letter, in other words, right? Um, and then, so I'll, I'll speak in English instead of zoning terms, but with the deadline in the letter, with what's going on, that deadline gets extended, and we can agree to that um, even in writing uh, with the with the deferral. But by code, a pending appeal. Uh, defers enforcement action. So the deadline would be stretched to the appeal. I, I have a proposal, um, Madam Chairman. I don't think our evidence is a snapshot in time. I think it shows a continuum. 
that meets the burden. Um, it, it, and if I if I urge my client to uh, take a deferral to find you know more pieces of paper that prove the same thing, then are you know does that diminish the evidence that we've presented? Uh, I think we've presented. I think we've met the burden. And I would propose that the board um, overturn the determination and make the decision today with the condition. And I, we've heard some concerns um, that my client takes very seriously that we work with staff to make sure that we address neighborhood concerns. And if the staff can identify any particular concerns that um, this site presents, because after all, we're talking about floodplain hazard, uh, then we would um, commit to work with staff to address those. Madam Chairman, that's, uh, that's, that's nice for Mr. Blaine to say that, but I don't think it's enforceable at this point in time. So if, if the issue before you is pretty clear. Either you're going to have to make the decision today, or if, if, if you don't have a deferral from the applicant, then the decision is going to be made for you because of the 90-day period is going to expire before your next meeting. Understood. So Mr. Blaine, if what you're saying to us is you want us to vote today. Yes, after, all, after all you've heard from, from each of these members, you'd like us to vote today. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Is there any further discussion from the board on this? <laughs> I'd like to just get staff's um, perhaps updated opinion. It's taken a lot of brain power to get to where we are today. A lot of collective thinking. I'm interested as we crystallize around this issue of whether or not the use has stopped for two years uh, in between when the flood hazard overlay district was enacted and today. Um, if that is the issue at hand, does staff have a, an opinion that is different than the one that was presented in the staff report? No. Okay. Any, any other discussions? No? Do we have anyone who would like to make a motion? <laughs> well, if you don't make a motion, then the issue is going to be resolved by itself. <laughs> right. Um. Well, at the risk of talking too much, I mean, I, I just think that in this situation where two years has to go by with no use of this being a storage yard or similar, um, it's a long time. And I think the window between now and going back to 2014 uh, starts to be condensed with some of the evidence that we have in our packet. Um, And, and so I'm, in, I'm inclined to, to say that this has been a use that's been ongoing. So <clears throat> I don't want to cut my other board members short, but that's um, my perspective after looking at this, this packet. That's fine. And it's, and it's not like, a motion. It's not a motion? Okay. Um, I'd love to just give my fellow board members another moment. It's 517, but I'll, I'll give them a, another moment. <laughs> another moment? Um, well, normally the chair doesn't make the motion, but since nobody else is moving, um, I moved that the Board of Zoning Appeals affirm the Zoning Administrator's determination in ZVIO 2022-076. Is there a second? I second that. Okay. Is there any further discussion? 
Ms. Alley, will you please take the vote? Mr. Burkhart. You're muted, Mr. Burkhart. I will pass at the moment, please. Mr. Shepard? No. Mr. Carrington? No. Mr. Rob? Aye. Ms. Joseph? Aye. Mr. Burkhart? No. Okay, the no's have it. Uh, Madam Chair, am I to interpret that the uh, the complementary uh, motion that the determination is overturned? The determination is overturned. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank well, you. Thank you, everybody. Madam, Madam Chair, there has not been a motion made to overturn or reverse. The, the, the motion okay. that's made simply failed. There's not been a complementary or a converse motion. Oh. There be Sorry. such a converse motion and it would need to pass in order for that to be the case. I think that's correct, Andy. Okay. That's correct. Sorry. So um, would anyone like to make the converse motion? Ms. Joseph, I'll make the motion. <clears throat> I move to I move that the Board of Zoning Appeals overturn the zoning administration's administrator's determination in ZVIO 2022-076. There a second. I'll second that. Okay. Is there any discussion? Okay. Ms. Alley, would you please call the roll? Mr. Burkhart? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Carrington? Aye. Mr. Rob? No. Ms. Joseph? No. Okay. So you need a pronouncement of what the vote was, Madam Chairman. <laughs> the vote has been to over the, the vote was three to two and it was to overturn the Zoning Administrator's Determination for AP 2022-00002. Is that enough? Thank you. Do it. Staff, thank you so much for all your time that went into this. I really appreciate it. Yes, this is this is tough. This is a complicated one for sure. We have a few more things on the agenda we got to get through still. All righty, let's go quickly, right? Can we go quickly? Okay. The the next item is the approval of the minutes, March 1st, 2022. Does anyone have any comments? Anybody want to venture a motion on the minutes? I move we approve the minutes for March 2nd, 2022. Is there a second? Uh, Chairman, right. I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Rob. Excuse um, me, Ms. Joseph, I believe they're March 1st. I I'll say? take that as a friendly amendment. Okay. I move that we approve the March 1st, 2022 okay. minutes. Okay. Um, Mr. I second Rob. Second that. Second. Alrighty. Okay. Moved by Mr. Shepard. Seconded by Mr. Rob. Any discussion? Okay. Ms. Alley, would you please call the roll? Mr. Burkhart? Aye. Mr. Carrington? Aye. 
Ms. Joseph? Aye. Mr. Robb? Aye. Mr. Shepherd? Aye. Okay. Next item. You know, Carolyn, okay. One thing that Ms. Shelley may be willing to do is after the mo after she reads the motion, get announce the result on the record. And that would save a lot of time. And it may it may be important two or three years in the future. If she'll do that, if you think that's a good idea. I, I think that that's what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and I well, just it, I'm, I'm, I've seen do it in many cases. Well, so it's, it's very here, there, and everywhere. No, you are you are correct. I'm just tired, so I'm, but, so. Anyways, um, yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. Um, but it's so yes, we'll remember that the next time. So, um, Ms. Alley, you you send me a, a friendly nod. And re please remind me that I need to do that. Um, but I think I was just sort of caught off guard. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, the next item is old business. Is there anything that you guys have that you want to discuss? Okay, let's go on to new business. Review the rules of procedure and that you added a whole new part on remote participation. Yeah, I'm gonna let uh, Andy take this one from here. This is a, uh, about some new stuff uh, at mm -hmm. the state level that um, we need to make adjustments for. Actually, it's old stuff, but Andy will discuss that. <laughs> it's an old <laughs> statute. <laughs> So, so, Madam Chair, members of the board, Andy Herrick with the County Attorney's Office again, and it's actually a mixture of both old and new. Um, the Freedom of Information Act, as you know, has been around for a long time, um, but in the in the wake of the the COVID and all the electronic meetings that have been occurring, the General Assembly has made pretty significant modifications in the rules regarding remote participation. Um, while it is not yet allowing all virtual meetings of boards of zoning appeals, boards of supervisors, planning commissions, and school boards, it is allowing for a more um, permissive use of remote participation by individual members if they have a medical condition um, or some sort of personal circumstance. And the uh, proposed amendments to the rules of procedure that you have before you are limited to section seven of the, of the BZA's rules of procedure. And what they do basically is track uh, the most recent changes to state law that are going to take effect as of September 1st. Um, the, the good news, again, is that they allow the more permissive use by individual members of, of appearing remotely. Um, the bad news is, again, that the General Assembly, uh, though it is allowing all virtual meetings of certain other types of bodies, is not allowing all virtual meetings of local boards of zoning appeals. So that, uh, if, if you're looking through this and, and asking why don't we have the ability to meet all virtually under these rules, that's why it's because the General Assembly doesn't allow it outside of an emergency, which has been the basis for the all virtual meetings that we've had over the last two and a half years. Um, as a result of that, um, just by way of heads up, the next meeting that we have in September will be in person or, or whenever we meet again will be in person mm -hmm. uh, because the basis of our meeting virtually over the last two and a half years has been the local continuity of government ordinance. Um, now that the uh, local emergency has been declared ended, um, our ability to meet virtually under that continuity of, of, of government ordinance is about to end as well. Um, but the proposed amendments that staff has brought forward today are to address um, non-emergency individual participation going forward. And, and again, they track state law. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about these proposed Rule change. Actually, let, let me let me uh, state one other thing just procedurally. There would not be a vote on this today other than to put it on a future agenda for a vote at the next available meeting. Um, one of the rules of procedures provides that uh, that the BCA's rules of procedure can only be changed um, if there's a one meeting's worth of advance notice given to that. So if if the BCA is interested in um, pursuing this today there would be a vote, but it wouldn't be a vote to adopt these rules. It would be a vote to schedule it for the for a vote at the next meeting. So so with that, I think I've addressed everything and I'm happy to take your question. 
and as I understand it, the big the big change is that um, now um, you can get sick all you want and participate um, uh, virtually, but if uh, there's personal reason involved, you get two times to do it, and that's it. Right. And there's a real bigamaru and what has to be put on the record before you can uh, get into this virtual meeting with the member. You can always participate virtually and not vote. I thought it was so, pretty great. I mean, you can go on vacation now and still participate. So, Oh, you can just do that twice. <clears throat> well, I don't have that much money, Jim. I'm not going to be vacating that often. <laughs> so. no, you don't have to take weekend vacations or two-day vacations. <laughs> or you could say that you're on a mental health break for six months and uh, take the personal uh, medical condition exemption, right? I could do that. <laughs> well, the, the, you know, as Mr. Bowling points out, the personal circumstances exception is listed to uh, two times or one quarter of the meetings or less. So, um, but the medical, as Mr. Bowling points out, the medical condition is, is potentially unlimited. So. Okay. So do we want to um, vote on this at our, our next available meeting? Mr. Shepard. I move that we put the question of uh, revising our rules of procedure uh, as outlined here at our next available meeting. All righty. That'll be September. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Burkhardt seconds. Anybody else have any comments, questions that, that they want to add to this before we vote? Okay. Ms. Alley, would you please call the roll? Mr. Rob? Aye. Mr. Burkhart? Aye. Mr. Carrington? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. Ms. Joseph? Aye. Okay. Next item is the annual report update. So the, the board has synced that with um, the calendar year. Or I'm sorry, the fiscal year. Marcia mm -hmm. can jump in here where I get this wrong. Um, Miss Alley, the clerk. Um, so all we're going to do with this is you saw the report from last year. We're just kind of kind of refilling the blanks and we'll be sending that to the board. Um, we will be giving you a copy. So we'll go over that in, in kind of more detail in September. Okay. But there won't be a, a whole lot of explanation. It's just going to be a list of, of what, what was before the BZA and what the results were. Okay. Okay. And if I could add, that is due to the board. I believe it was September the 2nd. So we're working on that now. Um, so you won't see it before it goes to the board but we'll certainly copy you, you on that when it goes to the board. Uh, yeah, you'll probably see it in your packets before it goes to the board, but we won't, it'll be. Looking at my dates, the sixth. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that to you a couple of weeks before the meeting. So it goes out before the board date. Okay, thank you. All righty. Um... And the next item is contract renewal for legal counsel. If you all remember, we talked about this early on in the beginning of the year, and um, we just signed a contract that is exactly what Jim asked for, and that is going to the board. Is that correct, or where is that going? No, nope, no, nope, everything is settled. When you when y'all took your action in February, um, that was the vote for the rate. Um, one of the reasons this is on here is because we're starting the new fiscal year. It's July. So we were in July to June. And so this is also a reminder that um, this is the start of the new fiscal year and that this is the time the contract is active, July 1st to June 30th. We have copies of what we need for the record. And what we'll look at, and I think we talked about this last time, which is why we did it in February that was our first meeting of the year to make sure budget wise, we're way ahead of what the board is asking 
for for next year because they'll start asking in the fall for the following fiscal year. But for this fiscal year, the board did approve the ask of uh, the five thousand for uh, to cover the contract for legal counsel for Mr. Bull. So we're good. Yes. Yeah, and we can thank Mr. Shepard for making us get that done earlier rather yes. than later. So thank you, John. Yes. Um, You're welcome. Didn't want to miss the deadline again. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I, if I can uh, skip back to A for a moment under rules and procedures, Andy, sure. um, we'll be meeting in person in September, correct? That's correct. Okay. Just want to remind everybody of that while I got everybody here. So we'll be meeting live in the auditorium in September. Oh, man. It means we have to be careful how we dress. <laughs> but anyway, um, I just want to thank everybody for being so thoughtful and careful and interested as we went through these items today, because sometimes they just seem simple, but usually when they come to us, they're just not. They're just really complicated. So thank you for spending the time and it's 5.30. And you know, if I talk too much, I apologize, but I really think it's that I, I really am impressed with everybody's interest um, in what's going on and, and actually also research that you've done. So thank you. This is a good board. Anyway. I think it's time for us to, my computer says it's 535. So can I have a motion for adjournment? I'll make the motion that we adjourn um, the August 2nd meeting of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Thank you, Mr. Burkhardt. We have a second. Come on, John. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rob. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> can we just do, can we do one of those, all of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Right. We actually should probably do it by roll call so we have oh. a record, given that we are still okay. in an electronic meeting. Okay, 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 okay. Please, Ms. Alley, call the roll. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, even. Mr. Carrington? Aye. Mr. Rob? Aye. Mr. Burkhart? Aye. Mr. Shepherd? Aye. Ms. Joseph? Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank guys. You, Kim, I want to throw that out there also, just uh, winding up the thing about the, uh, the last item. Just thanks for helping us out, Jim. You're doing a great job. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. All right. We got a great team here. Go ahead. Okay. Thank everybody. Are, are we adjourned? We, we are adjourned. Good evening. Okay. Bye. Good night, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a good night.